I've started recording. Welcome to week five. This is Mike Wilkes, and I'm going to share my screen and get started. So let's see if this is the right place. And go to present. Bring up my notes. Make them a little bigger. All right, so this should be the start. Um, everything's recording, mic levels look good. And welcome to week five of Information System Security and Management. And uh, this week is one of my favorite weeks. Um, there's a couple of them that I like particularly much. Um, the documentation and diagramming week eight. Uh, but incident response is of course uh, sexy and cool uh, because you know it's uh, a dangerous situation, right? If there's an incident going on and this is your chance to shine uh, if you're working the incident. And of course, we wanna make sure that bad things don't happen and we do all of the efforts uh, and activities we can to stop incidents from occurring, but uh, they will occur. And so <clears throat> this is gonna be uh, this week's lecture. All right, so red alert, all hands on deck, light up the war room, we've got a problem. Is this an incident? Or is it a false positive? Who do we need to get out of bed to investigate once the tier one SOC, the Security Operations Center, analysts have escalated the alert and opened an incident ticket? Incident response is fundamental to the mission of IT and InfoSec is a special set of category of incidents within that body of possible alerts and notifications. Cybersecurity incident response is a muscle. It needs to be exercised in order to function properly Otherwise it will, like a muscle, atrophy. This week, we dive into one of the most exciting and interesting areas of information system security and management. Um, before we can get into the details of incident response, we need to talk about some of the entities involved. At the center, of course, is your incident response team. Cybersecurity related attacks have become more numerous and more diverse. The potential to disrupt or damage an organization is clear. And while preventive activities can limit the extent to which the organization is affected, not all incidents can be prevented. Incident response is a complex undertaking. Establishing a successful incident response capability is essential. Direct linkages to the incident response team exist for customers, constituents and media, uh, other incident response teams, internet service providers and cloud service providers, incident reporters, uh, law enforcement agencies, software and managed service vendors and providers, and of course, internal teams and management. It's interesting to note uh, that uh, but, um, some uh, incidents are forced and some are unforced, as in it was sort of a, a landmine that we left for ourselves and or due to a failure in leadership, um, something can turn into an incident. It may or may not be a cybersecurity incident, uh, but the best and most recent example I can think of is the near apocalyptic meltdown of the Texas grid uh, during the winter storm. Uh, I think they were a few minutes away from having a complete shutdown of the grid, uh, which has never happened to my knowledge uh, in recent history at least and would have counted as probably the worst um, electrical you know, disturbance, I guess, or incident uh, in the history of there being electronic grids and there being electric, electric service. Um, quick, interesting historical side note, uh, New York City was the um, start of, I believe, the first grid uh, in the modern definition, I think, of the term. Uh, it was Thomas Edison who laid uh, direct current, not alternating current. Um, we got to using alternating current later. Uh, but using direct current, uh, they laid wires and cables underneath the streets uh, from the Pearl Street uh, substation, which was one of the first generators in Manhattan, uh, to J.P. Morgan's offices so that he could light his offices at night. Um, but anyway, a little bit of history. I think that was back around 1882. All right, so what are the precursors to an incident? Uh, events, alerts, potential incidents, an incident, and a breach. So before we can begin talking about incidents, we need to discuss the precursors to the incident. System and application logs, they record events. A login event or a logout event, for example, or a password change event. Some events can trigger alerts automatically based on the nature or frequency of the event. 
Event log management is the basis for incident response. If you don't have logging of events, it's considerably more difficult to detect malicious activity or to discern the normal activity from anomalous activity. Alerts can be raised by people as well as raised automatically, but the majority of alerts are triggered by automated processing of event logs for devices, services, and application activity. Potential incidents uh, are those alerts which are being investigated. Once categorized and validated as an incident, the next stage is a potential breach. Defining what a breach, what is a breach and what is not a breach is not an easy undertaking. Uh, many uh, folks want to be very explicit about when they declare a breach because there's reporting requirements that are tied uh, to breach notification in different jurisdictions, uh, in different states. Um, in the US, I think we have 56 states and territories and each of them have uh, varying degrees of breach notification requirements. Some of them uh, as soon as possible, some of them 24 hours, others 42 hours. Um, some of them are as lax, I think, um, as potentially 30 days uh, before you have to report it. Attack vectors. Um, let's see, external removable media, uh, attrition, web, emails, improper usage, loss or theft of equipment and other. So we're gonna go through each of these. Uh, incidents can occur in countless ways. So it is unfeasible to develop a step-by-step -step instruction for handling every single kind and type of incident. It is helpful, however, to outline some common attack vectors. It's also fairly safe to characterize attack vectors as being targeted towards the weakest link. Bad actors, they have budgets too. They wanna to find the most impact and reach for their activity. So they focus on cheap and repeatable or scalable techniques and vulnerabilities. Um, by the way, I think I didn't mention the background um, that I'm using today, just in case you're curious. I was using a Union Square with some pigeons flying um, by, or wait, no, Washington Square. Uh, this is uh, Ithaca Falls um, taken in Labor Day um, vacation. Uh, a beautiful uh, trip if you've never been to Ithaca. All right, so under attack vectors, we have external removable media as one of them. Um, external removable media, uh, an attack can be executed from removable media, like a flash drive, uh, a CD-ROM, um, even a music CD, uh, or other USB-based um, devices uh, or peripherals. Uh, you may have seen, for example, people on the street back when populations of people were walking around the streets and not just locked in and staying home. Uh, you'd find people handing out music CDs uh, on the street corner. They may well have been legitimate musicians that were trying to get their music distributed. Um, but it could also be the case that someone offered to mm, you know, press those CDs to record them and, and write them uh, and author them uh, for you know, a discount because they put some malware on the, on the CD. Uh, it certainly happened uh, in, I think, the TV show, Mr. Robot, that, that was one of the uh, Patient Zero attacks. Um, and so anyway, putting removable media into your machine uh, from an untrusted source is certainly uh, a bad thing to do, um, whether you're working for a security company or any other company. Uh, ideally, we would block uh, USB port controls uh, with policy. And so most people would not have the ability to read or write from a USB uh, hard drive, for example. But sadly, it is all too common for someone to leave around a USB thumb drive with some malware on it, and the curious person inserts it into their computer. Uh, it could also be a Good Samaritan type, um, you know, thought process that's going on behind there. So, oh, if I lost my USB stick, I'd like to get it back. Maybe we can figure out who it is by putting it in and looking at the files. And of course, if those files have malware on them, uh, and uh, you know, if you have a zero-day exploit, for example, uh, something which an antivirus or an endpoint protection agent uh, wouldn't be able to detect, uh, then that's certainly a, a successful way to gain entry into an infrastructure. I've actually used this attack vector on red team exercises previously, uh, where we would take five or six of these USB sticks um, and put a benign malware document on it. Uh, so it doesn't actually infect the workstation, but it does beacon out, meaning it will send a signal to um, an S3 bucket or to uh, an API service, make a web call you know, from within that macro, and it would report back you know, the time uh, and uh, IP address and, and machine name uh, that it was inserted into. And then we can go back and uh, gently chastise and reprimand, you know, the person that, uh, you know, was either curious uh, or, um, you know, 
interested in returning it to its owner. And uh, these are good activities to plan periodically just to uh, keep people on their toes. Um, one of the th clever examples I remember seeing uh, someone had written Bitcoin wallet uh, on the USB drive. <clears throat> that just, of course, adds a third factor <clears throat> as to why someone would put it into their computer. Um, greed, right? Um, Bitcoin wallet might be worth a lot of money um, at this point in time, depending on how many coins are on it. All right, so um, yeah, curiosity, um, Good Samaritan, and uh, greed are, are certainly uh, combined you know, with this attack vector. Uh, now next is attrition, an attack that employs brute force methods to compromise, degrade, or destroy systems, networks, or services. So if you don't have a failed password limit, meaning if somebody enters the wrong password multiple times on a device, uh, or on a service uh, or on a web page. Uh, brute force attacks are actually easy to create uh, because that failed password limit would stop you know, that IP address for a period of hours or indefinitely, uh, or potentially lock uh, the account uh, until it's unlocked by an administrator. And so without that failed password limit, uh, this is a very uh, powerful method for gaining access. And it's not that hard. Um, brute force used to be a more expensive um, kind of attack vector. Uh, but now with the ease uh, and uh, inexpensive compute that's available, uh, if you find a service that doesn't have a password limit, a failed password limit, uh, especially web-based, uh, you can basically you know, throw compromised passwords out there from these breach data sets uh, from the dark web. Uh, an example, um, a denial of service uh, um, could be intended to impair or deny access to an application. And uh, a distributed denial of service, a DDoS uh, attack, uh, is the variant of this, but it employs many endpoints, uh, usually a botnet or a set of compromised computers, uh, or more recently, uh, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, um, which are sort of dumb devices that don't have a lot of uh, security wrapped around them. Uh, think of you know an internet-connected light bulb, uh, a voice assistant, um, a connected coffee machine, you know, there's all sorts of devices that have embedded Linux usually on them. And they, you know, oftentimes don't get firmware updates. And so they're uh, quite easy uh, to use. And when they're internet connected, you can take them over and uh, generate, um, you know, a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack. Uh, of course, one of the big uh, attack vectors for anyone that operates a website is the web itself. So an attack executed from a website or a web-based application. Um, here we're talking maybe OWASP, you know, top 10 kind of controls. Uh, an example here would be a cross-site scripting attack that's used to steal credentials, um, embedding a web page from another vendor in your page in a lookalike domain. Uh, you could also have a redirect to a site that exploits a, a web browser vulnerability and installs malware. Uh, so there's all sorts of uh, web-based attack vectors that uh, we should be paying attention to and um, trying to mitigate. And of course, email. Uh, I think email is probably one of the more one of the most common attack vectors at the moment, uh, just because everyone has email. And despite our controls and tools and techniques to protect our email and our inboxes from unwanted uh, malicious mail, uh, a lot of it gets through. Um, what was it? Uh, an attack executed via an email message or an attachment. So exploit code is essentially disguised as an attached document, uh, or it's embedded in that document uh, with macros, for example. Uh, or it could be a link to a malicious website in the body of an email message. And I think uh, we were talking maybe recently uh, about uh, Office 365 and some new techniques that spammers are using to get into your inbox. Uh, the same techniques are used by um, you know, bad actors. Uh, to get past some of the controls. And so one of the clever ones I remember reading about recently was uh, a sort of out of office reply um, technique. And they would put you know, the, um, the malicious link uh, in the out of office reply, or they know uh, return receipts, right? That was another technique that was being exploited by spammers uh, to get mail into your inbox and in front of your eyes uh, so that they could potentially you know, get you to buy something. Um, or uh, what uh, you know, bad actors you know, to install malware or, or lead you to a, um, you know, a, a malicious link. And they're bypassing a lot of the general rules that are used uh, to process anti-spam and anti-malicious uh, mail and malware email. 
And uh, that's just using the own system, uh, the mailing system headers uh, against itself. So Office 365 was being hit with a bunch of new techniques that were taking advantage of, like I said, return receipt uh, mail. And so they put a special header in there that says, send the return receipt here. And that's the address that they would change. And so they would send it to a message, they know it would get bounced, but the return receipt message uh, would still get sent and that wouldn't get anti-spam filtered. And that would end up in the uh, target or victim's uh, inbox and then have the uh, link embedded in it. Um, another thing that was being reported recently was um, uh, Google Alerts. So let's say you go to, um, what is it, google.com slash alerts or something like that. And you set up an alert saying, I wanna see all of the interesting news around, um, insert you know, a subject that you're interested in here. Um, it could be uh, Lady Gaga's um, you know, bulldog, you know, terrier bulldogs that were kidnapped and, and the dog walker was shot recently, right? It's a recent popular event. Someone might want to follow that event and say what they would set up an alert. So the bad guys are doing this as well. And so they're actually injecting all sorts of keywords into their malware pages um, and making sure they get indexed by Google's alert engine. And they show up on a trusted message of alerts every day for your favorite subject. Um, some people do on-demand alerts, other people do a daily digest. And so they could potentially click on the link in there because they're obfuscating um, all of the uh, you know, links uh, and uh, bad you know, um, assets on that page. So when Google scans it, it knows it's Google that's scanning it and they don't show the bad links. Um, and then if they get it successfully indexed under that keyword, then Google's the one that's actually delivering the mail to your inbox. And then the malware shows up on the page that you go and you're innocently looking for an update on a particular topic that you're following. Um, it could be, you know, like I said, any kind of topic. Um, current events uh, are usually quite popular you know, to uh, exploit in this direction though, of course. Um, but we're gonna be talking about more about email and um, incident response and attack uh, as we go through the uh, phases of incident response. Another attack vector is simply improper usage. So any incident that results from a violation of an organization's acceptable use policies or controls uh, by an authorized user um, excludes the previously mentioned categories, of course. So let's say a user installs file sharing software. Um, they want to you know, use something like um, you know, torrent uh, software. Uh, in order to access um, you know, all sorts of content, some of it legal, perhaps some of it illegal. And uh, this could lead to a loss of sensitive data. Uh, if the user has the permission to install you know, applications uh, with that you know, a bad uh, or missing control, you don't want that. You don't want random uh, files from a, a user on the internet um, uh, to be able to download and install them uh, that haven't been verified and checked uh, by the security or IS team. Uh, another example, like file sharing protocols have found them their way into Microsoft um, uh, Windows, exam for example. So in order to help people get Windows updates, they're using the fact that they can embed a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service inside of this uh, Windows, I think it was in Windows um, 10. And uh, by default, it's turned on so that people can download chunks of the updates from machines that are close to them on the network. Uh, ostensibly, this is for the benefit of users experience, right? So that they can download the updates faster. But these file sharing services can be breached and you know, potentially access to your hard drive and its files uh, can be unintentionally uh, lead to data loss. Um, and so of course, uh, that's one violation or miss of a control and that would be considered improper usage. Uh, if you let people install this file sharing software, peer-to-peer uh, -peer network sharing type technologies. Uh, and of course, if a user performs illegal activities, if they're downloading, you know, um, Pirate Bay, you know, movies and, uh, you know, um, games and things like that, uh, that can certainly be another control violation because you're actually breaking the law there and not just breaking company policy. Of course, loss or theft of equipment is an easy attack vector. Uh, the loss or theft of a computing device by, or the media used by the organization, such as a laptop uh, or a smartphone. Uh, what are our mitigations here? Uh, full device encryption, of course, and um, find my iPhone, uh, and then you can remote wipe. Um, other uh, mobile device management tools uh, have different techniques for allowing you to do that. You, you may or may not have uh, the luxury of an hour or two before uh, the device is wiped by the person that stole it, and the, these remote wipe techniques uh, are no longer uh, available to you. Uh, oftentimes, they don't want to 
harvest and mine the data that's on that lost or stolen laptop uh, or um, smartphone. Oftentimes they just want the hardware value from it, uh, from a reseller, from a pawn shop or something like that. And so in many cases, you don't have to worry about data theft and, and data loss. Uh, but as InfoSec professionals, uh, we do and want to mitigate against someone doing a targeted theft, stealing a specific person's laptop or phone and you know, either cloning it or, or extracting you know, authentication tokens from it, for example. Uh, let's see, what is it? Um, yeah, a misplaced laptop, um, you know, mobile phone. Obviously, when you go through uh, TSA at the airport, uh, there's a lot of devices that um, get lost uh, and forgotten, essentially. Uh, this actually, this photo that you see here <clears throat> is one that I found of TSA laptops and iPads. Um, that had been left behind after going through um, security. And uh, according to a what 2009 uh, Pondemon Institute study, 92% of IT security practitioners report that someone in their organization has had a laptop lost or stolen. And 71% report that it resulted in a data breach. Uh, so you know, it could be a sig significant data breach or just a, you know, a fairly minor one, depending on the interesting, you know, the data classification. What's the sensitivity of the data on the phone or on the laptop or on the iPad? But of course, if you have full device encryption enabled combined with a passcode for mobile devices, uh, those are both a fairly reliable mitigation for that risk. Although I do understand there are some uh, specialty organizations, um, not um, a small number of which operate out of Israel, uh, that are capable of getting past uh, the passcode. Uh, if you have possession of a device, physical possession of it. Uh, there are definitely techniques uh, for putting it into a, some type of debug mode or cloning the drive, uh, and then you know, reading the contents of it and extracting something of value, besides just the actual resale value of the, of the object. And of course, there's other, right? The other attack vector, uh, an attack that really doesn't fit into the other categories. Uh, you may have heard of the unknown unknowns, a uh, famous uh, quote from, I think, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, we have our known knowns and our known unknowns, and then we have our unknown unknowns. And so the Shadow Brokers, for example, uh, is a hacker group who first appeared in the summer of 2016. They published several leaks containing hacking tools from the National Security Agency, the NSA, uh, including several zero-day exploits. Uh, specifically, these exploits and vulnerabilities targeted enterprise firewalls, uh, how to bypass antivirus software, and how to compromise Microsoft products. And so in the case of uh, these unknown unknowns, this is sort of one of the sources of them, right? Um, hacker groups. Uh, and of course, here we should probably make mention of APT. Uh, APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. N numbers are actually assigned uh, to APTs uh, to track their activities and to try to establish attribution for an attack or an event. Uh, this is, however, problematic uh, due to the nature of bad guys trying to misdirect and to avoid attribution. And of course, shared compromised devices, right? Some of these APTs, multiple of them can be installed on the same compromised device at the same time. Uh, for example, APT 37 and APT 38 uh, appear to be operating uh, in support of North Korea. Uh, although they're not necessarily connected, uh, APT 39 is uh, referring to an Iranian espionage, espionage group. And uh, APT 29, which many people may have heard about recently, is sometimes referred to as Cozy Bear, uh, which was uh, believed by many security researchers uh, to be the organization behind the SolarWinds supply chain uh, attack. And let's see, APT 40 uh, is a China Nexus espionage group, for example. And it's funny, I was thinking, I was talking to, um, what was it, Chris Roberts. Uh, if you've never heard of Chris Roberts, he's a, a very um, charismatic uh, security and uh, very uh, enthusiastic um, security researcher and professional. And if you've seen him speak, uh, or if you look for some of his lectures on YouTube, uh, you'll see that he has, you know, a multicolored um, dyed beard, bald head. Uh, he wears a kilt um, and he uh, you know, wears, I think, um, what are they called? Uh, finger shoes or whatever, or toe shoes. At least when I saw him speak, he was wearing them. And uh, he's, like I said, uh, well-known, well-respected, um, often pulled into lots of uh, incidents uh, for his knowledge and experience in response. He maintains an APT threat list and watch list uh, that you can access um, if you find it. 
where he keeps track of some of their uh, techniques, uh, tactics, and practices, uh, their TTPs, and um, and different uh, attribution data. Because, like I said, that's um, not an easy thing to do to figure out who it is. Because sometimes the Chinese will leave behind, you know, fragments and comments in the code that will make you think that it was the Israelis or the Russians. And sometimes the Russians will leave behind things to make you think it was the North Koreans. So there's a lot of uh, misdirection going on here. But anyway, I found um, it interesting. I was wondering what is the US, right? Because the US is doing advanced persistent um, threats. We have an active cyber command. And I asked him, well, which APT number is assigned you know, to um, the US if, if you're working in one of these other countries, Germany, you know, Israel, the Netherlands, you know, France or something. And he said APT zero which of course is um, funny. And of course, what would be the animal that would be assigned to it? Potentially an eagle or something, right? Because Cozy Bear and all the Russians ones, uh, all the Russian families of APTs are categorized as bears and China's as pandas and uh, different types of uh, animals uh, or insects um, and uh, are used in them. Uh, but you can find out more about that in this next uh, resource. If you haven't done so already, and I know there's an assignment this week that you may or may not have begun yet, uh, which is to read the CrowdStrike um, Global Threat Report for 2020 um, and uh, to do a, a summary, a writing summary of reading that report. Because uh, oftentimes we have to read reports that are detailed and then report back what's an interesting takeaway to the executive team. Uh, what should we be thinking about as a company once they ask you uh, to read these uh, reports? CrowdStrike, um, all sorts of organizations, Proofpoint, um, you know, FireEye, they, they put these out. I just um, downloaded the 2021 report today and added in the screenshot here of its cover. And I added it to the course repository. So you will see um, GTR 2019, 2020, and 2021 in there. Uh, let's see. The 2021 report mentions uh, that CrowdStrike has added 19 named adversaries uh, in 2020. Uh, bringing their total to 149 tracked actors across the globe. So think of those APT uh, numbers. And uh, you can find details on each of them uh, at a URL that they've, I think, recently invented called adversary.crowdstrike.com. Uh, the link is in the slide notes, which you can get later. Uh, but uh, full disclosure here, uh, I'm not affiliated in any way with CrowdStrike, uh, nor does the inclusion of their threat report in this lecture constitute an endorsement by NYU or its affiliates. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it's a great source of information. And as educators, we're allowed to share all sorts of things uh, and uh, for the benefit of, of you, the students. And so now that we've reviewed some of the attack vectors, I think let's take a look at some of the threat intelligence that's available. Uh, like I said, Cisco, Akamai, FireEye, SecureWorks, and many other vendors publish threat reports that provide valuable details and insights. Uh, kill chain is a term that comes up. I think this is a, a, an image that I grabbed out of the CrowdStrike 2020 report. Uh, when responding to an incident, the objective is to detect and stop the attack as early as possible in the kill chain progression. And what you see here is you know, the attack chain. So the kill chain is how quickly to the left can you stop the attack. The earlier the attack is stopped, the less damage is done and the less the attacker learns about the target network. The cyber kill chain uh, specifies what an attacker must complete in order to accomplish their goal. Uh, so if the first piece is uh, recon. Uh, recon, how do you mitigate recon? Well, you, you can actually detect a lot of recon activity. Uh, so you can meet the challenge of, of uh, recon uh, with detection. Uh, next comes weaponization uh, of a particular vulnerability that they're going to throw at you. And of course, weaponization can be met with uh, service denials and blocks. Weaponization is an active um, you know, attempt to breach an exploit, or at least them <clears throat> figuring out how to turn a particular exploit, exploit into a, um, an attack. Uh, next comes delivery, right? So they've weaponized the code. They've done recon to figure out what your vulnerabilities are. Now they have to deliver it. Uh, delivery, you know, our mitigation, our blocking technique as defenders uh, is disruption. So you have to disrupt the delivery. Uh, you need to have antivirus, anti-malware, parsing the emails, uh, detonation of attachments in microservices, you know, virtual uh, environments to see what the bad behavior is and blocking it based on its uh, behavioral um, um, uh, 
uh, observations. Uh, and there are third party services that'll do this for you as well. You don't have to have a detonation, you know, VM and download the email and put it there and attach it. There's, you know, services that will do that for you. Uh, next, after, if they're successful at delivery, the bad guys need to install. Um, uh, yeah, delivery, what was it? Oh, no, I think I missed exploitation. Um, so they need to actually exploit successfully the delivered vulnerability. Uh, and then comes installation. Installation of the malware and the weaponized um, vulnerability uh, as malware uh, is to be met with disruption and degradation. So if you can't necessarily stop them, you can slow them down. So think of software-defined networking and honeypots and uh, quicksand, it's called, where you have um, you know, a potentially uh, weak uh, and exploitable device on your network uh, using deception, and they infect that. And then you start slowing down that machine's ability to do the things that it's asked for, uh, or its ability to access the network. And so that's the sort of quicksand approach uh, to degrading, you know, the attacker's um, ability to move laterally or within your organization while you have time to respond. And while you work on understanding who it is, what was the malware, how you stop it, and what is their intent. Uh, sometimes people let uh, an improvised, uh, an an exploited or compromised device uh, run for a while um, because you need to know and want to know what they're trying to do next. What was their goal? Um, let's see. Then after installation comes uh, command and control, uh, C and C it's called, or C2. Uh, this of course can be met with deception. So you can put, you know, like I'd mentioned before, um, you know, a hundred decoys on your network uh, and those can be infected and there's nothing you know, that would be compromised on them. Uh, but the bad guys think they've compromised the machine. Uh, by putting a weak password or a honey token on it to authenticate. And then when that token is used, you can have a silent alarm go off and say, hey, someone's starting to use our honey pot token or our honey token. Uh, there's open source tools for this. One of them, I believe, is called Space Siren, uh, which works natively with AWS. I'm going to be taking a look at that um, for fun and uh, potential use uh, in different areas. Uh, let's see what else. After command and control, then exfiltration, right? So if they've able to deliver the malware uh, that gets past your defenses uh, and it installs itself, it's going to then reach out with command and control and say, what do I do next? Perfect example was the SolarWinds breach, uh, SolarWinds supply chain attack. Uh, there was actually an intentional two-week delay built into the malware so that when it reached the installation phase, it would lie low for two weeks. Um, why? Uh, one of the reasons is because a lot of uh, automated uh, um, sort of behavioral based um, endpoint uh, protection and detection and response tools and agents kind of look for immediate behaviors, right? Malware was installed uh, and then it starts, you know, doing a DNS query out to a server in, in Russia. It doesn't always have to be Russia, but it can always, like in the uh, SolarWinds case, they were setting up command and control endpoints uh, to tell the malware what to do um, within the US and within geographic regions that were close and sort of uh, explainable uh, in a SOC analyst point of view. If a SOC you know, alert goes off, it's not considered an incident yet. It's an event. Uh, what is the event? A piece of software is installed. It looks clean, but you don't know if it was. And it starts you know, beaconing out you know, to a command and control server on what to do next. Uh, aside from the fact that that should be blocked and not have egress, you know, internet access to anywhere on the internet for your servers, um, a lot of people don't implement that as because uh, it's difficult to do. Uh, but anyway, so the command and control event could be detected by the SOC, uh, but if they hide or mask, you know, uh, their infrastructure and don't you know, home it, you know, in a in a high risk geography, uh, then the SOC could potentially close the alert and say <coughs> there was no malicious behavior be here because it went to a server in Florida or it went to um, a server in California. And if your company is in California, there's plenty of reasons to think that there'd be a content deployment network or other kinds of phone home activity happening on your network uh, that would be explainable. And so that was one of the reasons they were able to operate in what's called a low and slow method uh, with their command and control. And putting two weeks between the download and install of the malware event and its first moment to beacon out, basically the malware would uh, launch uh, or get launched as a library within, you know, the Orion server uh, for SolarWinds. And it would check the install date of the uh, malware. And if it wasn't two weeks yet, it would then just go back to sleep. Uh, and I think we talked about this in week one or two, uh, that you can 
to deceive malware into staying asleep uh, if you answer a lot of their questions uh, in a particular way, like saying, oh, you're on a VM, you're in a detonation chamber, and we have a whole bunch of antivirus waiting to observe what you're about to do. Um, that's one way to mitigate uh, that risk as well. But of course, they haven't really done anything yet other than install a payload and get access. They need persistent remote access. So they're gonna try to install um, a, a rat uh, next, uh, a remote access Trojan or, or a web shell and uh, be able to gain persistent remote access to that because that system, that malware is beaconing out saying I'm ready for my next instructions. And if it doesn't ever get any, you know, that's good for you, but bad for the attackers. Uh, but anyway, then they're going to try to exfiltrate data. And so how do we stop exfiltration? Well, we can destroy, you know, the uh, installation um, binary. Uh, we can break uh, communications with command and control, uh, like they did, for example, with um, SolarWinds. They took over the domains that were being used as the command and control targets. Uh, Microsoft helped with that because a lot of that infrastructure was running actually on Azure. Uh, and uh, you can then, of course, eradicate you know, the installation once you see this command and control behavior. That's what a lot of people have been doing with the SolarWinds event since it uh, landed. And uh, it'll be something going on for months, if not years. Uh, I think some recent threat intelligence uh, work done by my company, uh, Security Scorecard, uh, one of our threat intelligence researchers believes and has demonstrated that some of the code used uh, in these attacks was not uh, dedicated just to the SolarWinds Orion supply chain attack. And some of it dates back to 2017. Uh, so these threat actors have been using this technique and, and some of the code fragments at least uh, have been uh, sort of backdated uh, by inspection and investigation uh, to two years earlier uh, than the earliest date, which was I think October, 2019, uh, was considered one of the original you know, event windows in the timeline of SolarWinds. Uh, but that could be even two, two years earlier now, according to recent research. Uh, all right, what else? Um, interactive intrusion activity over time. So this is a, a quick graph that I pulled out of the CrowdStrike um, Global Threat Report for 2021. Targeted activity, of course, is increasing, as shown here, uh, but not at the same rate as unattributed activity and e-crime maintains its position as the dominant observed activity. And this is from a specific group within CrowdStrike and a specific type of um, activity. So this is from the uh, Falcon Overwatched, uh, sorry, Overwatch Managed Threat Hunting Team. So they are called in when you have a CrowdStrike subscription for Falcon. Uh, and it's crowdsourced, they have a SOC, they have all these events heading out to the cloud. And when an incident escalates, uh, an alert or a log event turns into an incident, <coughs> they reach out to this you know, tier two, tier three analysts uh, to dive into it further. So according to this, in just two years, in the last two years, a fourfold increase has been seen in what is called hands-on or interactive intrusions. Uh, so basically this, this number and these numbers does not include um, automated intrusions where it's completely automated, like ransomware and things like that. And of course, organized crime is, is you know, chewing up a huge um, e-crime, uh, chewing up a big chunk of that uh, observed activity right now. Uh, this graph was interesting because it was a very concrete number and it shows a huge increase uh, between 2017 and 2018. So this is from the CrowdStrike uh, Global Threat Report for 2019, and this was their threat graph data. So clients of their Falcon agents are deployed back then at the time of the report in 176 countries. I imagine they have about the same number now. Uh, and this is growing uh, pretty massively, right? The number of uh, threat events uh, and events per day uh, between 2017 and 2018. What do we do? We, we go here from like 90 billion to 240 billion. And of course, imagine that just one of these events could be a malware infection on a single device. And of course, if vulnerabilities exist on that device that allow privilege escalation to become administrator or root, and many devices have several of these paths available to them at any given time uh, because of patching cadence, because of libraries and you know, zero day volumes and things like that. Uh, and so the patient zero, as you might call it, if you use the um, uh, uh, virus outbreak um, uh, analogy or language, patient zero uh, device will be owned uh, by the attacker fairly quickly. According to their research, the average breakout time window uh, in 2018 observed by CrowdStrike was four hours and 37 minutes. So that's the time between patient zero and the next lateral movement and infecting another machine. And how do they do that? Well, they would level up to the local administrator privilege. And then that local administrator privilege would oftentimes be the same password that's used on all of the laptops or all of the servers. 
uh, a shared um, account essentially instead of one per device. And they don't even need to know or learn what the password is. They can just pull the hash of the password out and use a tool called Mimikatz uh, to use that to auth um, on another neighboring device, uh, which connected to it recently or was in its ARP table, for example. And so that lateral movement happens you know, in 2018, uh, four hours, 37 minutes on average. That's the amount of the time for the attacker to move laterally uh, from the first device, first device infected to others. Uh, in 2021, that average is now one hour and 58 minutes, according to their website. And the fastest among them, right? Remember, that's just the average. The fastest among them uh, actually breaks out in 18 minutes and 49 seconds. Uh, so you can imagine if you have 19 minutes to detect and mitigate a response uh, to a threat actor. And these are some Russian APTs that have been demonstrated uh, to be able to move laterally that quickly. Uh, one of the golden rules, I think it's uh, CrowdStrike that publishes this uh, in incident response is 11060. One minute for detection, otherwise you've lost. Uh, 10 minutes to investigate, otherwise you've lost. And 60 minutes to remediate. Uh, and of course, as you can see, uh, those wouldn't even cover for some of those really fast acting um, APTs that can do uh, lateral movement in uh, less than 19 minutes or 19 minutes or less. I mean, anyway, so that just sort of shows you the stakes uh, that we're operating on, how much automation is present in the uh, malware and uh, how much automation we need on you know, the InfoSec side. Uh, let's see, dwell time, uh, certainly a useful and interesting term. Uh, basically, dwell time is your mean time to detect, your MTDD, uh, plus your mean time to repair or mediate, right? MTTR. That's uh, add those two together and you get dwell time. So that's the length of time an attacker has in the environment until they're either detected or eradicated. Um, and uh, let's see, MTTA, I guess, is uh, medi mean time to awareness. So you may not be able to act on it, but you may at least have an alert go off and you know, start, start up an incident response. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, it's usually measured in days, uh, dwell time. Uh, in 2011, the global median dwell time was 416 days. Uh, in 2018, that was just 78 days. Uh, and that was down from 101 median dwell time in 2017. Uh, numbers from several sources put that at 49 days in as recently as 2019. Uh, so that means we're getting better, right? Um, the dwell time's going down and uh, that's good, right? Automated response and detection, you know, behavioral uh, antivirus rather than just signature based is contributes to that. Uh, it's, this is in part basically due to moving <coughs> like I said, beyond uh, legacy signature-based antivirus tools, because they can obfuscate the code and the signatures don't match. They can deliver a unique malware attachment per email for every thousands of emails that go out, they can have thousands of um, signatures. And so you know, antivirus signature-based tools are still useful for those that they detect, but they're not sufficient to cover this new kind of you know, um, polymorphous code, for example. And of course, there's also changing tactics um, from the attackers and uh, the rise of malware as a service uh, fa favoring ransomware in the last two years, uh, which is fairly easy to detect. So imagine if you just want to, you know, rather than espionage, you just want to get some ransomware and some Bitcoin, you know, transferred to your account. You don't mind being discovered more quickly, right? Because you're ransoming the, uh, the device. You're popping up a screen saying, hey, you can't access these files till you pay. So that's one of the contributing factors to the, me the median dwell time decreasing over the last few years. So it's a complicated set of, um, uh, sometimes the attackers are trying to play low and slow, um, and other times they're playing fast and quick and high, I guess you could say high visibility, high um, observability. Um, and of course, we're getting better at, at detecting. And so that's part of the equation. Uh, one of the poster child examples of dwell time uh, would be the Nortel Networks story. So if you've never heard of Nortel Networks, I believe it was a Canadian based company. And it was compromised for 10 years um, before it was detected. 10 years. Uh, talk about advanced persistent threat. I mean, the initial breach was believed to have occurred in 2000. Uh, and it was attributed to Chinese hackers who used seven passwords that were stolen from top Nortel executives, including the CEO. And they were able to maintain a persistent presence by hiding their spying software on their infrastructure. 
Nortel actually could not confirm whether the breach continued after it filed for bankruptcy in the year 2009, uh, according to news reports. And uh, time to detection was essentially four years from 2000, when somebody in 2004 <clears throat> noticed uh, reports and traffic. <coughs> I think it was the InfoSec officer, and you can probably find his name by Googling it. Um, Someone noticed reports and traffic from Nortel were regularly being sent to Shanghai-based IP addresses. Uh, so again, the, the focus on egress monitoring, right? Traffic coming out of your network uh, is a major area of development and improvement that most companies need to think about how to detect it and block it. Uh, anyway, so the bankruptcy was uh, in part due to a lack of disclosure of the breach. And uh, so anyway, if you want to read more about Nortel, there's plenty of articles I think that have been written around it. And a couple more recently um, that were stirred up uh, in a bit of actual FUD uh, about the Chinese uh, and um, blocking and sanctions. I'm not to say that the Chinese are not doing bad advanced persistent threats and stealing intellectual property and you know, um, attacking uh, US and other companies. Uh, but Sometimes, you know, there's a bit of, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, mixed into the news cycle. And so sometimes these stories would be written to just sort of build up, you know, anti-Chinese sentiment uh, uh, in the event, you know, that we do have trade war type activities. Um, I think it could end fairly badly uh, for us, given our dependence on a lot of things that uh, China is producing in their engine and their economy. Uh, in many cases, China has bought the rights, you know, to minerals and uh, mining uh, in South America and Australia and other places for the next 50 years. Um, and so that's going to be quite uh, a control grip that they'll be able to exercise. Uh, but anyway, next up, uh, spending on cybersecurity in the United States from 2010 to 2018 in billions. Uh, this source, uh, this graph here was taken from Statista.com. I went looking today to try to find um, a more recent uh, graph to uh, add to the deck uh, for this, um, but unfortunately I was unable to find it. I think this shows what 66 billion in 2018. It looks like it was a 6 billion increase uh, between 2017, 2018. I'm guessing given, you know, some of the events of late 2019, 2020, would show at least you know um, a 10 billion increase uh, so 76 billion would be my guess um, at the moment uh, for where we are in the uh, growth curve here uh, and this is just the us the rest of the world spends actually less than the us uh, on cybersecurity. Um, spending on cybersecurity and cyber insurance globally from 2015 until 2020 so this number includes the us so what did we see for the 2019 number um, 66 for just the US, uh, that only leaves uh, 54 billion for the rest of the world, uh, if 120 was the global spending. And of course, cyber insurance spending is going up as well. Um, more ransomware attacks and events, and uh, that drives up premiums, of course. Let's see, so where are we? We're at 47 minutes in, and I'm on slide 19, so we're doing very well. All right, phases of incident response. There are four, five, and six incident response phases models. Uh, we're going to look at the six phase model, and uh, but the others, you know, are quite similar. In the six phase incident response model, you have preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and the one that a lot of people uh, forget: uh, lessons learned. Uh, how do you take an incident response uh, um, and a root cause analysis uh, paper? and turn it back into how do we avoid this happening again? A lot of times people are just exhausted and tired after an incident, they've done an executed recovery and then they need to recover themselves and uh, go to sleep and you know catch up on some rest. Um, because a lot of times these things play out over you know, weeks, um, not just a, a long day or two. Uh, so alrighty now, so we finally made it to the main topic for this week's lecture. <clears throat> and as we've done in previous weeks, we're gonna define some terms Incident response, IR. It's a structured methodology for handling security incidents, breaches, and cyber threats. A well-defined incident response plan allows you to effectively identify, minimize the damage, and reduce the cost of a cyber attack while finding and fixing the cause to prevent future attacks. Uh, NIST incident response process contains four steps. Uh, and so just uh, for comparison, uh, those four are preparation, they do detection and analysis in the same phase. Uh, then three, 
uh, in the NIST cycle, uh, phase three is containment, eradication, and recovery. So they're merging those. Uh, and then phase four is post-incident activity, right? Which we refer to in the sixth phase one as, as lessons learned. What's gonna happen after the incident has been closed. So let's walk through these. Um, preparation, security awareness training, uh, configuration management database, diagrams and documentation, change control, uh, configuration baselines, logging, uh, daily SOPs, uh, secure uh, standard operating procedures. Uh, the preparation phase is all about ensuring that you have the appropriate um, you know, documents, you know, response plans, communication plans, dozens of policy documents that have been written and approved by the organization, uh, call trees uh, for escalation, uh, in case someone's not picking up their phone, you know, can you call um, uh, another number and reach them? Uh, and uh, of course, other documents need to be in place uh, that you have identified the members of your incident response team, uh, including external entities. And as they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, and so preparation is, is definitely an important part of uh, incident response. Six phases of incident response. Now let's talk about um, a little bit actually diving into preparation. Let's talk about security awareness training. So security awareness training involves and includes phishing tests, uh, tabletop exercises, uh, red team exercises, uh, secure coding and development uh, training, uh, social media hygiene. You can do lunch and learns on these topics, for example. Uh, GDPR data handling procedures. You can set up training for that and send Typically, your HR and legal teams are the ones that have access to a lot of what's considered personal data for GDPR. And so you assign them that training, uh, and that's part of security awareness uh, and preparation. Uh, according to uh, something that I had written here, 91% of attacks start with phishing, uh, general phishing as well as spear phishing. And about 14% of phishing emails are clicked on uh, based on industry averages. Uh, it varies a little bit by media industry versus financial services or you know retail, for example. Uh, but in general, the overall phishing uh, email click rate is 14%. And so if you have, what, uh, you know, 100 people in your organization, 10% you know, would be uh, 10 clicking on it, 14% would be 14 clicking on it. Uh, if you build up the ability <clears throat> for those users to detect suspicious emails, uh, and test monthly, uh, then you're doing a lot of preventative work, right? And it's worth a lot more uh, in, in reaction and response tools and technologies to invest in security awareness training. Uh, so I've, I've been testing every month um, for the last, you know, three or four companies I've been working in, uh, sending out tests every month and uh, varying them based on what we observe in the wild, uh, as well as specific um, attacks that are focused on our particular you know users and um, our particular you know business uh, that we're in and what might get someone to click on a link uh, and not read the email fully or carefully uh, but i should mention that i like to take a carrot approach not a stick approach so we don't um, shame people for clicking on a phishing test um, instead you know we want to reward them and give positive uh, reinforcement and so um, in those tests, you know, we, we have uh, automated uh, learning that they get assigned to uh, to help them. And I always leave behind what I call breadcrumbs. I might have mentioned this before, but I'll put intentional typos into the phishing test emails and uh, intentional um, grammatical errors uh, because I want to train them to see those and to be skeptical and to doubt whether it's really the help desk team telling them that they have to do something. Um, and that's, of course, widely used technique by the bad guys um, to try to impersonate uh, the support to organization uh, to click on something. Uh, let's see, what else falls under, um, oh, let's, let's move on to preparation. Um, in this case, not security awareness training, but CMDB, uh, configuration management database. I've talked about this in a couple of lectures. Uh, we learned about this uh, last week without good asset management like a CMDB, the job of InfoSec is lost uh, and it, grasping at truth and facts and, and the necessary details are just not available. 
so do we have any servers running Apache struts, for example, uh, if there is a vulnerability uh, announced about uh, the Apache struts library? And there's been many, uh, and many significant breaches were actually caused by people not keeping up with their Apache struts uh, framework library um, updates. Uh, or Microsoft um, RDP gateways, uh, remote desktop uh, protocol gateways. These are certainly common and familiar um, boogeymen. Uh, and then, of course, shown here, I have what um, some spices and herbs and uh, objects that you might find in a uh, Chinese herbal medicine um, store. Uh, that's my way of referring to the configuration management database. Uh, what kinds of things do you have um, and do you have uh, a good inventory of all of them? Uh, also under preparation, I talk about diagrams, right? Uh, and there's a whole week dedicated to it. Week eight's lecture is about documentation and diagrams. Uh, you can do a lot of um, improvements on your incident response by having diagrams and enforcing that people keep them up to date, because then you can understand what the path of, uh, you know, um, contagion might be from a breached uh, of device. So high level diagrams, data flow diagrams, system diagrams, a uh, high level diagram, high level diagram is something that just sort of shows logically on a like very Duplo blocks kind of thing. Like this is a web service. This is a third party that we use to host our blog and the blog, you know, um, has been compromised, right? So in the high level diagram, you know, oh, it was not stuff that we own and operate, but something that we've, you know, um, outsourced, you know, to a third party. That can help you understand, you know, whether or not you have to worry about, you know, uh, being infected or what is the path and communication uh, from the uh, breached organization or uh, device to yours. Data flow diagrams, um, DFDs are important to have so that you can uh, understand impact um, to taking down some of your infrastructure if you believe it's been infected. You want to quarantine it, you want to isolate it, you want to power it down potentially. Uh, what is that going to do to your data flow? Is it going to stop the business from working? Uh, is it going to stop certain services uh, or all of them? And it really depends what's in fact impacted. If you don't have a data flow diagram, that's a lot more difficult to suss out. Uh, even you know everyone's on a call talking about it having a diagram golden uh, and then for, third um, i like to you know make sure that i have at least one system diagram uh, system diagram like um, you know the actual server names and devices like shown here uh, this is a network diagram that i found on the internet um, and it shows routers and switches and you know um, redundant uh, you know network connections and uh, this is useful, of course, in understanding, you know, all sorts of impacts uh, due to outages, uh, whether it's a cybersecurity incident or just a generic incident. Imagine if you had a good high level system diagram for Texas's grid and you knew that if, you know, a certain key set of generation capacity, you know, went offline, that there'd be this big cascading effect, right, um, of other dependencies on that. Uh, one of the things I remember reading about the Texas uh, outage was that there were plenty of gas plants that could have generated uh, power, uh, but they had electric compressors to keep the gas in the pipes flowing to those uh, generation units. And the electricity outage and the rolling outage, the rolling blackouts actually impacted some of the generation capacity as well. And so the electric compressors were offline Therefore, the gas couldn't move through the pipes and they lost even more uh, power. Uh, if I remember correctly, they went from like 65 gigawatts down to about 40 gigawatts during the um, you know, big uh, event. And I think that was uh, over like a Monday and a Tuesday in February. And uh, they were hovering at 35 you know, uh, gigawatts um, capacity for a couple of days until they could bring things back online and the cold snap um, passed. Uh, lots of failures there. Um, really good example of systemic risk, actually. Uh, the topic for the webinar that I'll be um, giving on Thursday, uh, which I think I sent out an announcement about. But anyway, um, so yeah, the more diagrams that you have, uh, the more documentation you have, the better, actually. Um, and uh, this is the basis for being able to explain to someone uh, what something is made of, how it processes data, and what interfaces or connections it has. Uh, also in the preparation area, change control. Um, if you have a mature change control process, and here I refer to CAB and LCAB, uh, a change advisory board, CAB, uh, is engrossed ex exclusively on appraising change requests for risk and unintentional consequences and advising the change manager of their conclusions and endorsements. Uh, so part of the ITIL framework, this is a formal change request process linked with the software development lifecycle, the SDLC. In large organizations, 
uh, it seems most relevant and needed. In smaller organizations, you might have an LCAP, uh, a local change advisory board, uh, which can be delegated for low impact change requests, saving the cab for only you know, high impact uh, changes to be reviewed. Uh, it should be noted that the CICD uh, configuration, no, no, continuous uh, integration and continuous deployment, um, it does not actually do away with cabs, um, but it does bring a degree of automation to the task of approving and gating uh, releases of code and uh, configuration changes. And let's see, uh, configuration baselines. Uh, I wanted to mention CIS here, the Center for Internet Security, uh, in terms of preparation. Uh, you can set up really solid configuration baselines for your servers uh, and for your, they have software and OS um, uh, baselines. For Apache, for example, there's CIS controls and benchmarks and baselines. For Linux, uh, for Windows, you can actually buy uh, har pre-hardened images from the Amazon um, AMI marketplace. So you don't have to harden your servers yourself. You can actually buy them pre-hardened according to the CIS benchmarks. Uh, and um, I think I put the link in here, uh, ci, CI security.org. And uh, they also have um, different uh, techniques for assessing and you can run CIS benchmarks against your infrastructure, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. Uh, to determine whether you're meeting those top 20 controls uh, that are considered standard best practices in security uh, for configurations and baseline and hardening. So I highly recommend taking advantage of Center for Internet Security CIS. One of the other aspects of preparation is logging, right? If you're not logging things, <laughs> if you don't have any events or alerts, um, then, you know, or at least an awareness of them, uh, if you don't have logging. And so here is an example of um, ECLF. Uh, this is a web server log. Uh, ECLF stands for Extended Common Log Format. Um, this is uh, one of the really most powerful things about logging is, of course, it can tell you lots of useful information. Uh, so what do we see here? Um, let's see, what else? Uh, here, here are some ECF log lines to give you an example. And so let me pull my notes out of the way and just uh, walk through it. So the first field on the first line is the client IP address, right? The remote IP address. Uh, second field is unused. Third field um, is in the standard, uh, the user, uh, if it's using basic auth. So if the service is using basic auth, the username will show up in the third field. But right here, it's just a null or a dash. Uh, then comes your month, day, year, and then you know hour, minute, second, and then GMT offset. So that's your time date stamp. Uh, then a space, uh, then a quote, and then the method. Uh, in this case, the first request that we see in this log line is a GET request. Uh, and it's a GET for slash robots.txt using the HTTP 1.1 protocol. It's important actually to know which ones or which protocols are being used. <clears throat> then after that comes the status code, uh, the response from the server, which was a 200, which is okay. Uh, then comes uh, 2880, which is the number of bytes transferred. Uh, this is important to know capacity uh, and whether or not the request um, is an exfiltration, actually. You can actually see exfiltration of data where, like, um, you know, a uh, really huge, you know, number of bytes transferred for a simple request um, can be suspicious. So you can set up monitoring, actually, on variations, uh, order of magnitude variations of responses. Because sometimes the HTML response code is dynamic, meaning it has different information. Let's say you log in and it has a report, and the report has 10 entries. Well, that HTML is going to have more bytes to it, right? Uh, and then comes um, referring URL, in this case is null, because nothing referred the robots.txt requests to, you know, the robot. Uh, then comes the user agent string, which is the bit between quotes from Mozilla all the way to HTM uh, end parenthesis. And this is the thing that's uh, awesome that a lot of people don't realize how much data and information is in there. Uh, if you look at one of the other examples, that's not the um, Bing uh, search engine uh, bot, uh, but you look at uh, the second entry from IP address 114.119.134.128. Uh, this is a February 28th request to contact.htm. Uh, the response code was 200, the number of bytes transferred 5066, and the request was made from an iPad um, using uh, iOS 7, it looks like. Um, and it was uh, a Safari, um, right? And it shows the build version and number of Safari on there. And so that's an important bit, right? That tells me OS um, and whether or not they're updating, you know, this user at that address at 114.119. Um, and I think I took these requests out of my um, eclectic.com uh, access logs for Apache. Uh, so these are just real world requests, you know, uh, for the contact page, for the homepage. Um, and, you know, you can see curl 
uh, is used in that last entry um, as the user agent string, which is a command line tool that you and I, I think, have been using a bit in some of our lectures. Uh, I love to use curl for things. Um, so that's a text-based um, web browser client uh, agent string. Anyway, so if you don't have any logging, you're not going to have any alerts, and you may not even know that you've been breached. And unfortunately, that was the case with a lot of um, solar wind victims. They didn't have logging turned on, so they can't even tell if they were compromised. So they kind of have to build fresh and assume that they were, and then hopefully turn on logging for the first time. What else? Um, you should be surprised. You would you would be surprised that a number of organizations that I've audited and consulted with who don't actually feel logging was worth the disk space. Um, so here we, yeah, I was going to jump out and show you those um, log file entry lines, which I did. Okay. Uh, another aspect of preparation would be writing SOPs and having a daily SOP, right? A daily standing operating procedure. So the best way to operationalize an InfoSec program is to write up SOPs and to make sure that the offshore or anyone really um, could in a pinch uh, when others, you know, who do it under normal circumstances are unavailable, anyone could read this document, follow the steps and perform the task. So no real special knowledge should be required. Uh, perhaps some elevated access might be needed temporarily for an average, you know, um, you know, help desk team user to do um, a particular investigation task um, that might be needed. But once that's granted or approved, the task should be pretty self-contained in the documentation. And it might include an FAQ, right? A frequently asked questions uh, page uh, or a troubleshooting section as well. And uh, this section should be updated periodically as new users <clears throat> that join are asked uh, to QA the documentation. Uh, so that's one of the ways that I like to keep things fresh. Every new user that comes onto the InfoSec team, the new hire, uh, has to QA the docs and take it over and, and refresh it with you know their experience and, and to notice how things have changed um, since the doc was written and to improve it. And this should be, uh, these docs uh, should be updated periodically. And like I said, I outsource it sort of to the, to the new hires. Um, so what do we see here? Directions um, for making, uh, I think, a uh, bowl of noodles. Uh, but anyway, so that's an SOP example for cooking, right? And if you have a daily SOP, uh, that way you can always make sure that someone's uh, um, checking on the stuff that's not monitored automatically that might require a little bit of um, you know, human attention every now and then, uh, like checking certain dashboards for alerts. Uh, and of course, identification now. We've moved on from preparation. Uh, so we're on to phase two. Uh, communicate, escalate, do no harm, uh, incident categorization, prioritization, initial diagnosis, and investigation. So in the identification phase, you need to work out whether you're dealing with an event or an incident. Uh, an event just could be something happened, it triggered an alarm. An incident is what you're about to determine. Was it an, an interesting event? Uh, this is where your understanding of your environment is critical, of course, because it means looking for significant deviations from normal traffic baselines and other methods. Uh, when I talk about do no harm, as a principle of incident response. Uh, it speaks to the example from the medical profession and the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, we don't want folks destroying forensic evidence in their desire to fix the problem uh, or fix the incident. Sometimes you're not, the best thing you can do is to not fix it actually. Uh, that's why we have procedures and that's why training is so important uh, that we don't harm, you know, the potential to do forensic investigation later on. Uh, so that's why you need to write policies and procedures. People need to be trained on them and tested on them regularly. Uh, containment phase, uh, limit the damage, stop the spread of the attack. So once the identification phase has been executed and you know what you're up against, uh, you get to move on into the containment phase. Uh, the incident manager can approve moving on to the containment phase, uh, but you have to keep in mind that the root cause, you may not actually know the root cause yet, even though you're in containment, uh, you've at least identified what the malware is that has landed, for example, and why you know, your mitigations didn't work. Uh, or if they did, what are you gonna do about patient zero? Uh, maybe it was an isolated laptop that was shut down and you still have an infected laptop to deal with, right? So you, how do you bring it up safely? Uh, or a server that had to be shut down or a file share. Um, but anyway, an exhaustive root cause analysis is not the goal of incident response. That happens later in lessons learned. So like I said, it's okay to not actually know what the root cause uh, of the breach was if you're in containment, because uh, you're simply trying to contain the breach that has occurred. And there could be an additional attack um, happening through another um, technique 
at the same time. You may actually have to have two incident response teams uh, in flight at the same time. Sometimes attackers like to rob the team of their attention and to do multiple attacks at once. Uh, in the containment stage, you'll want to work with the business to limit the damage caused to systems and prevent any further damage from occurring. Uh, this includes short-term and long-term containment activities. So for example, a ransomware containment activity that could be business impacting would be to shut down a file share that the laptop or workstation or servers uh, has access to because you don't want the ransomware to start encrypting you know, um, uh, the entire corporate you know, file share um, drive. And uh, that could mean shutting down the file share for everyone and that would impact business. And so you need to have that be part of your discussion as to what steps you're going to take in the short term and long term uh, to contain the spread of an incident. Uh, the eradication phase, uh, the removal of the malware and remote access Trojan or other exploit code. During the fourth stage, uh, the eradication phase, the emphasis is on ensuring that you have a clean system ready to restore. Uh, this may be a complete re-imaging of a system or a restore from a known good backup. Unfortunately, uh, many organizations and incident response teams get caught moving to this phase too soon and they experience what is called reinfection. So the original attack vector was not fully understood or the attacker has now pivoted after discovery of new targets and has deployed additional measures to remain on the platform. Some of the most pernicious of these so-called fileless attacks uh, they maintain persistence uh, without use or reliance upon file system files. So even if you do a proper file uh, restore from a backup uh, before a ransomware event, uh, you could be reinfected and uh, it could maintain persistence in, in other areas, uh, not through just files like actual malware that can be removed, and the malware payload. Uh, they work in the system memory uh, or in system registry uh, in the case of Windows operating systems. And so behavioral analytics are one of the best defenses against these more advanced threats. And let's see, the idea of um, you know, reinfection and moving on too soon to the removal or eradication phase uh, is that you know, many times if you're restoring from a backup, the vulnerability that got you into this mess will most likely be present in that restored snapshot, right? Uh, because you haven't patched it with the latest, you know, um, security updates. And so you may need to use, you know, like sort of a clean room or a green um, uh, restore process somewhere on a completely isolated and unrelated network uh, or unlinked network, restore there, then apply some security updates and patches related to the vulnerability that was exploited, and then move it over back to your production environment or, or whatever environment that was compromised. Uh, so you have to be careful not to sort of bring back uh, an infectable instance because then you can have what I mentioned, uh, reinfection. And that happens a lot, actually. Um, what was the example? Um, I think it was the folks that were studying uh, Sunburst and Sol SolarWinds Orion. Um, some earlier attacks by the same APT using different techniques. Uh, there were reinfections happening every year or two uh, with um, a company that was uh, investigating them. And so it doesn't have to be reinfection, you know, at, you know, the same day, right? It's like uh, whack-a-mole, right? It doesn't happen that fast. Sometimes the mole pops its head, you know, a year later, um, and you still haven't figured out how they got in, uh, and you thought you eradicated and finished your incident response. And then, of course, um, recovery. You know, um, this is phase five of incident response in a six-phase model. Uh, at this point, it's time to determine when to bring the system back into production and how long. You're going to monitor the system for any signs of abnormal activity. You know, the incident response team doesn't get to go back to bed uh, and, you know, sleep it off you know, for the next couple of days after they've restored uh, a clean backup uh, from a ransomware incident. Uh, it's important to note that the recovery state, it might not be exactly as it was before the incident, right? So you're not recovering to a known good state. You may have to recover to a newly adapted state. You could potentially be accepting a degraded you know, system level of service. Uh, and uh, shown here, I think uh, this is a photo from the bionic leg of Steve Austin, the $6 million man. Um, so ideally, we want to make things bigger, better, faster, stronger, you know, all that kind of stuff uh, as a part of recovery. And not just returning to the state it was beforehand, because remember, that state was vulnerable, it got breached. And lastly, we reach stage six, or phase six, lessons learned. 
this final stage is often skipped as the business moves back to normal operations, but it's critical to look back and heed the lessons learned. Uh, these lessons will allow you to incorporate additional activities uh, and knowledge back into your incident response process. Maybe something didn't go so well in the actual incident response and you wanna update your incident response. Maybe there was a critical decision point that wasn't taken that ought to be injected into your response plans um, so that you have a better outcomes in the future and uh, have additional defenses available. Uh, publication of an RCA, uh, a root cause analysis report, uh, will usually include a lessons learned section after the description of the incident uh, and after the timeline and after the steps that were taken to regain control. Uh, and this is an important step of documentation in incident response. So I recommend you know, focusing on you know, one, phase one and phase six, because uh, those are the most impactful actually. How quickly you get from phase one to phase six um, is a matter of practice and technique and uh, availability of good documentation and good automation. Uh, but remember phase one was uh, preparation, put a lot of effort into preparation and put a lot of effort into lessons learned in response. Uh, and recovery and lessons learned phase so that you can not keep getting bit you know and hit by the same you know uh, vulnerability multiple times was it um you know fool me once shame on you uh fool me twice you know shame on me all right so let's see i think i have a little bit of water left all right let's talk about the nist cybersecurity framework the nist cybersecurity framework provides a policy framework of computer security guidance for how private sector organizations in the United States can assess and improve their ability to prevent, detect, and respond to cyber attacks. The framework has been translated into many languages and is used by the governments of Japan and Israel, among others. Uh, it provides a high level taxonomy of cybersecurity outcomes and a methodology to assess and manage those outcomes. Uh, the NIST CSF, as it's called, um, is not, um what um it's not the only framework right there are others uh you can do iso 27001 you can do nist 800 stroke 53 um cmmc uh the cyber uh, maturity model um i forget the uh, acronym actually off the top of my head but anyway there are others but i'm going to discuss nist because it's really accessible uh it also gives you a bit of a recipe on how to proceed uh, not just a checklist and a che bunch of boxes to be checked to say, do you have this control? Yes or no. Uh, and so we have five categories in the NIST cybersecurity framework. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. We want to use the NIST CSF to focus on policy maturity and practice maturity. So you can be good at one or the other or both, ideally. Um, but the NIST CSF and measures of it, and you'll be using one of these spreadsheets uh, with a spider graph in it for your security assessments uh, of the organizations for your projects. Um, you can actually identify uh, deltas between the policy maturity and the practice maturity, because some organizations are good on policy, but their practice lags behind and vice versa. Uh, it's more than just a bunch of controls and checkboxes for auditors. Each part of the information security program and its tools and processes falls into one of these functions. So I'm going to walk through these um, briefly here and just tell you a little bit about them. Identify. Develop the organizational understanding to manage cybersecurity risk to systems, assets, data, and capabilities. So under identify, you have um, several subcategories, uh, and they are abbreviated like um, ID for identify, and then a two-letter abbreviation like AM for asset management. Uh, so within identify you have asset management uh, this is the data the personnel the devices the systems uh, facilities uh, that enable the organization to achieve business purposes um, uh, they're identified and managed consistent with their relative importance to business objectives and the organization's risk strategy um, some of the aspects of identify for business environment be uh, the organization's mission its objectives stakeholders and the activities are understood and prioritized. This information is used to inform cybersecurity roles, responsibilities, and risk management decisions. Um, the controls in the NIST CSF under uh, identify for governance, uh, GV. Um, this is the policies and procedures and processes to manage and monitor the organization's regulatory, legal, 
risk and environmental and operational environments are all understood and inform the management of cybersecurity risk. Uh, also under identify there is risk assessment, RA. The identification, the organization actually is, is able to understand the cybersecurity risk to the organizational operations, including missions, functions, image, reputation, as well as organizational assets and, and the individuals contained therein. Uh, risk management strategy, IDRM, uh, that's the organization's priorities, uh, constraints, uh, and risk tolerance. Oftentimes we don't get rid of risk, right? We just mitigate it and reduce it to an acceptable level that the business decides. Um, so risk tolerance, risk appetite, and assumptions uh, fall into this as well. Uh, and they should be established and used to report operational risk decisions and part of the risk register, uh, the corporate risk register, that is. Uh, and then lastly, supply, supply chain risk management, um, SC, under the ID category for identify. So the organization's priorities, constraints, and risks, tolerance, and assumptions are established and used to support risk decisions associated with the managing with managing the supply chain risk. Remember, third party, something I'm well informed in because that's the company I work for to help identify supply chain risk. And now the whole world knows what supply chain risk is because of the solar winds incident. Anyway, the organization has a place and has in place the process to identify, assess, and manage supply chain risk. And here, of course, it's not just something you do once a year, send out a questionnaire. It really needs to be uh, a continuous practice, right? Continuous monitoring of the risk of your third parties. And that's where automation comes into play, of course. Uh, moving into the protect category, uh, develop and implement the appropriate safeguards to ensure delivery of critical infrastructure services. Uh, so I'm not gonna go, well, I guess I can go through all of these a little bit more detail, because uh, again, NIST is a great framework. You can read up on it. There's you know, YouTube videos, LinkedIn Learning, Khan Academy, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and you can even find stuff on Microsoft Learn, I think it's called, uh, which is free. Uh, you only have to pay to take their tests, but you can get all of the um, training for free, actually, from Microsoft, uh, a lot of their stuff, at least. Uh, so under Protect category, you find things like access controls. Uh, are there access control lists and associated facilities to limit authorized users, processes, and devices uh, to just those uh, authorized activities and transactions? Uh, there's awareness and training, of course, under uh, Protect. Uh, the organization's personnel and partners are provided training, awareness, education. Uh, that could be mingled a little bit with, you know, um, identify, right, and preparation under the incident response phases. Um, but under NIST, um, Protect includes awareness and training. Uh, and of course, you want to do this regularly, like I said, monthly, um, uh, to have activities happening all the time. Not just phishing tests, but also lunch and learns and uh, secure coding practices and things like that. Uh, also under Protect, you get uh, data security, right? So how do you protect what are your controls uh, and information and records are managed in a consistent uh, manner? Um, in line with the organizational's, organization's risk strategy uh, to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the business information and customer information, data privacy as well. Uh, then next comes uh, information protection process and procedures. Uh, these are the you know, written documentation that we talked about, security policies uh, that address the scope and roles and responsibilities of management. Is the management connect? committed to it. These are the kinds of questions that you answer when you have a framework, you know, and a security assessment questionnaire sent your way, uh, or you send them to your vendors. Uh, are there procedures for maintaining, do they even have an InfoSec program, right? Or, or even any headcount that are responsible for InfoSec? That falls under, you know, protect. Uh, and then maintenance. Uh, maintenance and repairs of industrial control and information systems, as well as digital business systems, uh, and typical internet facing type um, is that performed you know, regularly? Is it consistent with the policies and procedures? And then lastly, under protect, we have protective technology. So what types of security solutions have been brought to bear uh, on you know, the ability to maintain you know, resilience, um, to maintain security uh, consistent with the policies and procedures uh, and agreements that the business has with its partners? Uh, third comes detect develop and implement the appropriate activities to identify the occurrence of a cybersecurity event. Uh, you can have anomalies and events. Do you have logging, right? Do you have anomaly tools and detection in place uh, for potential impact? Uh, continuous monitoring, of course, is important here, not just monitoring, um, because some people believe that if you do it once, it's monitored. But if you only do it once a year or even once a quarter, that may not be good enough. You may need to have something that does uh, and monitors for uh, your 
posture and security changes, as well as that of your third parties on a daily basis or a sub daily basis, multiple times per day. Uh, the information systems for security continuous monitoring uh, are monitored at discrete intervals to identify events and verify the effectiveness basically of, of protective measures. And then of course, detection processes and processes themselves. Um, does uh, detection involve having tools? Yes, um, monitoring tools, agents uh, that are looking and probing and scanning uh, to make sure that uh, the security uh, um, controls haven't um, accidentally been removed uh, or, or somehow you know, made invalid uh, and ineffective. Uh, so anyway, and now we reach uh, so respond, um, develop and implement the appropriate activities to take an action re regarding a detected event. So once you've detected, you have to respond. How quickly can you respond? How much automation is there? Um, how do you escalate, right? You have response planning, uh, you have communications. Um, do you have pre-canned uh, announcements like we've talked about for breach events uh, that have been blessed and approved by HR and an outside counsel uh, to make sure that you're not creating additional legal uh, uh, vulnerabilities and um, you know, exposures for the organization because you put something in a press release or spoke you know, um, too quickly without thinking uh, in an interview with someone about an incident. Um, you need to send people to media uh, training so that they know what to disclose and what not to disclose and how to answer in a polite way that they're not going to answer the question. So yeah, communications, um, stakeholders, who's been identified, you know, as the spokesperson during an event, do they know that, you know, do they have these, like I said, pre-canned and pre-approved um, statements ready to go? And in response, you, of course, you need to have analysis. You need to understand the adequate response and support to, to support the recovery activities. Uh, and of course, mitigations and what are your techniques and tools for mitigating, um, isolating a network device, um, capturing the memory of an infected server for forensic evidence to figure out how it was compromised. Uh, and of course, eradicating the incident is part of mitigation in NIST CSF. And then they also have an area called improvements under respond. Uh, so organizational response activities are improved by incorporating lessons learned. And so this is an explicit question on many due diligence questionnaires that I get and that are sent out, you know, um, widely in the business. Uh, do you have any evidence uh, and attestation that shows that you learned from your events? Well, if you can publish an RCA and share an RCA for maybe a non-terrible, you know, non-terribly, uh, um, you know, revealing um, incident, the fact that you have an RCA document or even there's a template for it and say all of our RCA documents look like this and they could just have, you know, lorem ipsum kind of, you know, template um, you know, text in it and, and disclose no actual data about a breach. Uh, that can be happy, uh, healthy and good to share with auditors and with third parties as well. And then lastly, in the NIST uh, five categories, we have recover. Uh, and this deals with developing and implementing the appropriate activities to maintain plans for resilience and to restore any capabilities or services that were impaired due to a cybersecurity event. Uh, so recovery planning, right? Do you have um, a disaster recovery plan? Um, do you have processes and procedures that are executed and maintained to ensure timely restoration of systems? Uh, when was the last time you did a DR test? Um, how long did it take to perform? How long did it take to recover? Was it within your internal SLA, your service level agreement for uh, various systems? Uh, were the recovery time objectives met? Uh, what about the recovery point objective? Uh, in the test, if you recovered you know, from a snapshot 48 hours ago instead of 24 hours ago, uh, that would be a finding you know, for the recovery uh, section of a DR test. And uh, let's see what else, communications, <clears throat> restorations activities involve lots of communications. Uh, coordination centers, internet service providers, owners of attacking systems, if they you know, infected you through a third party partner, you need to communicate to them that you're all good now and please don't infect us again. Uh, and of course, victims of the incident, uh, if you have customers data that was lost um, or you know exposed and other uh, incident response teams and vendors. So here we have Mm, a um, uh, unfilled out or a partially filled out, maybe, I guess, um, uh, NIST um, maturity worksheet. Uh, this is in the GitHub repo. Um, and I'm going to have to change the link in the notes because it looks like it points to the 2020 summer course instead of the spring. Um, but I can do that later. Um, but basically, it's called the 2018 NIST CSF maturity tool version 1, version 1 1.0.xlsx. And so you can hopefully use this to fill out uh, for the organization um, that you'll be um, 
I'm doing the security assessment for. Uh, so let's see, it looks like we're an hour and a half in. Time to move on to ITIL v4. ITIL. ITIL used to be an acronym, uh, but it's not anymore actually. But the acronym used to be Information Technology Infrastructure Library. Uh, it was released in February of 2019. Uh, it's a very flexible foundation for service management model, uh, common language uh, for people to describe you know, your security program and your IT program. And it's a good certification standard. Um, ITIL describes processes, procedures, tasks, and checklists, which are not organization specific and they're not technology specific, but they can be applied by an organization towards strategy and deliver value and uh, maintaining a minimum level of competency. So there is no formal independent third party compliance assessment available for ITIL. Uh, certification in ITIL is actually only available to individuals. Uh, so you can't have an ITIL certified org, but you can have an organization full of ITIL certified people. ITIL version four, fairly recent, um, given that it was February of 2019, it provides a flexible foundation for organizations that need to integrate various frameworks and approaches into their service management operating model. So ITIL v4 aims to help businesses navigate the new technology era of digital services. ITIL v3 was around for a long time. I can't even remember how long it was around for. And that's what I was actually originally certified on. Um, one of the few certifications I have actually. Um, and let's see, ITIL v4 defines four dimensions, uh, organizations and people, information and technology, partners and suppliers, and value streams and processes. So these dimensions are applicable to the service value system in general and to specific services. So this is a loaded term, um, service value system. Um, and ITIL, I think it's got a lot of English, uh, UK influence in it actually, um, has all sorts of wonderful conceptual models for you to look at. I'll, get, I'll show a couple of them too uh, in this uh, next couple of slides. Um, these components that I just mentioned represent a significant evolution of ITIL from previous iterations, from a specific focus on delivering services uh, to the broader perspective of the value created by the products and services delivered to the customer. ITIL 4 has been designed to provide a seamless transition from an organization's existing investment in ITIL and its current way of working to a faster and more flexible and adaptive approach. So you might have think of ITIL as kind of being around before, you know, Scrum and just-in-time, um, you know, agile-based uh, um, uh, release management technologies and approaches. Um, but uh, it has been revised um, to catch up and to not be too waterfall based, um, but to be more fleet of foot. Uh, so here I mentioned, remember that service value system concept, SVDS. Uh, it has uh, several areas, uh, guiding principles, governance, service value chain definition, continual improvement. So organizations basically to maximize what they call the co-creation of value with their customers by facilitating the outcomes that they want to achieve. So it's an outcome-based um, approach uh, in terms of you know, framework and uh, value system. The four dimensions of service management that I had on the other slide, they have shown that a holistic approach is the best way for an organization to meet its goals in delivering quality and cost-effective services, which meet the needs of its customers and satisfy the requirements of the stakeholders. Um, you know, the board of directors and investors, right? Uh, as well as other stakeholders. Uh, the ITIL SVS, it describes how all the components and activities of the organization work together as a, as a system to enable value creation. Uh, guiding systems, guiding principles, um, recommendations that can guide an organization in all circumstances, regardless of changes to its goals, strategies, type of work or management structure. So let's say that you went through an organization reorg the guiding principles may not change at all, um, but the reorg, you know, the organization can change its structure without affecting it. It can change um, some of its strategies and actual some of the details of its business and the type of work that it's involved in. The guiding principles might remain the same, uh, like you know, transparency, trust, things like that. Uh, governance is another layer here in the service value system. Uh, the means by which an organization is directed and controlled uh, think of, you know, um, operational risk committee, um, board of directors meetings, um, 
executive staff, you know, weekly meetings, things like that. That's part of governance. Uh, service value chain is a set of interconnected activities that an organization performs in the ITILV4 model uh, to deliver a valuable product or service to its consumers and to facilitate value realization. So we talked about that already. Practices. This is the layer that deals with a set of organizational resources uh, designed for performing the work or accomplishing a specific objective. And then last, um, besides the layer of practices, you have continual improvement. Uh, a recurring organizational activity performed at all levels to ensure that an organization's performance continually meets with stakeholders' expectations. Uh, through its flexible value-oriented operating model, ITIL SVS supports many different work uh, and deployment approaches from traditional processes and project management like waterfall and um, uh, longer term, you know, waterfall projects, if you haven't heard of that in project management terms. Waterfall means that, you know, you have very long drawn out phases of, um, you know, design and build and test and deploy. Uh, it can be six months, it could be a year, it could be even longer for certain projects based on the scope and size. Um, and uh, modern, much more modern practices that have to do with web services uh, iterate much more frequently, right? You have um, rapid development, rapid prototyping, agile DevOps, and different lean practices. So this is basically ITIL aligning with uh, this newer, uh, fresher, faster way of working <clears throat> where you have, um, uh, like I said, uh, things happening on a daily or a weekly basis even, right, uh, in an organization that represent the entire value chain of um, ITIL v4. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, ITIL has 34 practices um, and they're grouped into three categories. So this helps kind of bucket it up, right? Uh, 14 of those practices for ITIL v4 uh, fall under general management practices. 17 of them fall under service management practices and three of them fall under technical. Um, the 34 management practices, uh, these are <clears throat> what are called sets of organizational resources designed for performing work or accomplishing an objective. So for each practice, ITIL v4 provides various types of guidance, such as key terms and concepts, so success factors, key activities, information, objects, and etc. Under general, the 14 items under general uh, management practices, uh, these are applicable across the organization for the success of business and services. And then of course the 17 for service management, uh, these are applicable for specific services being developed, right? So not for the whole org, but for only specific units within the organization, certain business units. Um, and they're deployed and delivered and supported. And lastly, only three of the technical management practices are actual management practices that have to do with technique and techn technology. And they've been adapted from the technology management domains for service management purposes by expanding or shifting their focus from technology solutions to IT services. Uh, so sort of the generic instance rather than a specific class. And so here I put um, sort of a three-part, you know, yin-yang um, symbol or equivalent of a yin-yang, which is only gonna have two of these uh, in it, you know, to capture the general service and technical. Uh, and then I think lastly, for this particular um, slide, uh, key terms in ITIL v4 are availability. And I got this from BMC. Uh, BMC is uh, one of the organizations that uh, build software uh, that maps into ITIL v3 and now ITIL v4. And so you have the concept of availability, um, the availability of an IT service or other configuration to perform its function. Uh, you have IT asset, uh, any valuable component that can contribute to the delivery of an IT product or service. Uh, you have a definition of a term of an event, uh, any change of state that has significance for the management of a service or other configuration item. Uh, next up is the actual term CI or configuration item itself. Uh, that's any component that needs to be managed in order to deliver an IT service. So a configuration item could include a server, but could also include a switch uh, and it could also include um, a load balancer, you know, um, virtual server, for example, could be a CI. So it's not just um, hardware and objects, it's also uh, virtual CIs uh, that can be configured and Mac and, and have dependencies and have impacts. Uh, another useful key term in ITIL v4 is uh, um, change. And 
in this regard, we're talking about um, a change control, right? Or a change event, which changes state of objects and uh, configuration items. So change is the addition, modification, or removal of anything that could have a direct or indirect effect on services. Uh, and then of course, incident is defined as an unplanned interruption to a service or reduction in the quality of a service. Um, problem, and this is a loaded term in ITIL, problem and problem management. Um, you have a whole bunch of incidents. The incidents occur, eventually you should start to notice patterns, right? In these incidents, like gosh, this thing keeps happening. We keep having an incident regarding, I don't know, someone getting locked out of their account or something. And so that can be escalated to the level of problem. And so your problem manager and people operating at problem management level look for those sort of you know, recurring patterns in the incidents and say, okay, I'm gonna open a problem ticket. Uh, and that's the specific use case I'm thinking of is that um, incident tickets, you, know, you could have hundreds of them and never get around to solving the root cause, right? Unless you start thinking about problem management. So that's why the word problem is not just um, a normal use of the word here in ITIL um, definitions. Uh, this is the cause or potential cause of one or more incidents, essentially. <clears throat> and then known errors, uh, a problem that can be analyzed, um, but that has not been solved uh, or resolved. And so ITIL has, like I said, um, the ability to bring people together to use words in a, in a very precise and consistent manner. And that's one of the things I found most valuable about working in an organization that, um, that uh, decided to apply ITIL is that you didn't have people using sort of personal you know, language and uh, idiosyncratic definitions of things. And someone says, oh, well, that's a real problem. Um, but no, no, it's not a problem unless you've had several incidents that have turned into it. Uh, and you're tackling it at the problem level, right? Uh, and trying to keep the incidents from recurring. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's helpful sometimes to get people on the same page uh, with a lot of these uh, language uh, um, and uh, frameworks uh, like ITIL. All right, so now it's time to move into this week's, uh, this week's installment of InfoSec in the news. And, you know, of course, there's tons of uh, InfoSec in the news related to this week's topic. So I'm going to change the share and move over to a full desktop share because you never know what I'll need to look at with you to think about some of these news stories. All right, so here we are in the Slack channel looking at uh, Windows 10 Sun Valley design refresh. Here's what you need to know. Uh, Windows 10 Sun Valley UI refresh, otherwise known as version 21H2. It's reportedly arriving the second half of this year and will also include several new features. Um, is this an incident response story? No. Um, judge approved $650 million Facebook privacy lawsuit settlement. Um, yeah, let's see. I think this is fair enough to call this a uh, incident response discussion um, because there must have been something, you know, that triggered this $650 million privacy lawsuit. Uh, let's see. So a federal judge on Friday approved $650 million settlement against Facebook for allegedly using face tagging and other biometric data without the permission of its users. All right. U.S. District Judge James Donato approved a deal in a class action suit that was filed in Illinois in 2015. Uh, took a while to get processed. Huh? Uh, nearly 1.6 million Facebook users in Illinois who submitted claims will be affected. Um, it's not a lot of money per user. It's certainly not a lot of money for Facebook to deal with, but um, Denial calls one of the largest settlements ever for a privacy violation. It will put at least 345 into the hands of every class member interested in being compensated, uh, calling it a major win for consumers in the hotly contested area of digital privacy. Well, I don't think that's gonna stop Facebook from selling people's information, but uh, it certainly uh, is a precedent, uh, right? A first case that captures you know, this kind of um, uh, settlement uh, for privacy violations. Uh, basically, you need to have a consent page, right, for people to be able to use it. Um, and apparently, I imagine face tagging, you know, they would create some kind of generic identifier for who you are in your faces and be able to identify you in multiple profiles of so multiple photos and somehow use or sell that data. So they may not know your real name because let's say you don't have a safe Facebook account, but you show up in a bunch of your friends' Facebook accounts they can tell that that's you, they'll create a unique identifier for you, and they can potentially try to map who you are uh, through your browsing and your ad data, for example. 
Let's see. The lawsuit accused the social media giant of violating the Illinois privacy law by failing to get consent before using facial recognition technology. The state's Biometric Information Privacy Act allowed consumers to sue companies that didn't get permissions before harvesting data such as faces and fingerprints. Facebook has since changed its photo tagging system. Um, FTC fines Facebook $5 billion. Now that's a little bit larger, right, than 650 million, and adds limited oversight uh, on privacy. Um, but uh, let's look at this real quick, since this is probably interesting. Um, Biometric Privacy Act for Illinois. Uh, let's see. General Assembly, use of biometrics is growing. Major corporations like the city of Chicago for a state is piloting test sites for some new apps. Biometrics are unlike other unique identifiers. Um, for example, social security numbers when compromised can be changed. Biometrics, however, are biologically unique. An overwhelming majority of members of the public are weary of the use of biometrics when it's tied to finances and other personal information. Despite limited state law regulating the collection, um, they are deterred from partaking, partaking in biometric identifiers. The full ramifications of biometric policy technology are not fully known. The public welfare, social destruction, no, uh, retention and destruction of biometric identifiers is related here. Biometric identifier means a retina or iris scan, fingerprint, voice print, or scan of the hand or face geometry. Biometric identifiers do not include writing samples, written signatures, photographs. So just some definitions of terms. Um, let's see, collection, disclosure, and destruction of the data, a private entity in possession of biometric identifiers must develop a written policy made available to the public, establishing a retention schedule and guidelines for permanently destroying biometric identifiers and biometric information when the initial purpose of collecting and obtaining such identifiers or information has been satisfied within three years of the individual's last interaction. So that puts a cap on it. Interesting, three years. Um, anyway, not too much to dive into there. Just wanted to see what the Illinois law was talking about. There's several states that are ahead of the curve in this regard, with regard to having their police organizations decide to not use um, artificial intelligence combined with uh, Facial, facial recognition technology um, because there's been algorithmic bias, right? Um, and uh, unfair treatment uh, of different populations uh, due to the training models that went into it. And I think we talked about that previously in one of our um, other lectures. Uh, so let's go back to the news and look for some more incident response um, stories. Um, let's see, a journey combining web happy hacking and binary exploitation in the real world. Now, NSA and Microsoft promote a zero trust approach to cybersecurity. Um, this is the preparation phase, right? Of incident response. So let's open that link. The NSA and Microsoft promote a zero trust approach. This is part of you know, um, hype cycle, I would say, right? We're still in the, in the fat part of the hype cycle, part of the curve. Zero trust people, zero trust devices, zero trust workloads, zero trust networks, zero trust data, right? This is just putting the word zero trust in front of a bunch of stuff, right? There's no meaningful stuff happening here yet. Um, what do we get? The National Security Agency and Microsoft are advocating for the zero trust security model as a more efficient way for enterprises to defend against, um, to defend against, man, these uh, ads are annoying. I should probably put on the ad blocker when I do this. Anyway, the concept has been around for a while and centers on the assumption that an intruder may already be in the network. Yeah, well, that's definitely a good part of incident response. Assume the bad guys are already on the inside. Cybersecurity companies have published, no, have pushed zero trust network model for years as a transition from the traditional security design to considered only external threats, right? Remember we called that uh, perimeter-based security model. Um, the model was created in 2010 by John Kinderfach. I've actually had uh, lunch with him. Um, he is at Palo Alto um, as a field um, CTO. And uh, when he was in town, um, some folks I know at Palo Alto uh, wanted us to have a, a lunch and have a conversation. It was really good um, because he's a really you know, down to earth you know, guy. Um, I highly recommend uh, listening to some of his um, discussions uh, on the topic of zero trust. 
and I imagine this article was probably sponsored by Palo Alto, uh, although it said NSA and Microsoft, right? Um, but anyway, uh, let's see, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research um, at the time, uh, but talks about uh, had started in the early 2000s uh, as a concept of zero trust, which is um, never trust, always verify, right? We've already discussed zero trust a bit. Um, Google implemented zero trust concepts following the Operation Aurora in 2009 for an internal project uh, that became Beyond Corp. Um, zero trust defense for critical networks, recent solar winds, blah, 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 attributed to nation state actor. Zero trust would have helped a lot. It's true. Um, Microsoft President Brad Smith advocated for zero trust model in his testimony. Um, talking about the security, um, Smith said basic hygiene and security practices were not in place with the regularity, aka maybe daily, um, and discipline that we would expect of federal customers and agencies security profiles. In most cases, multi-factor authentication, least privilege access and other requirements to establish a zero trust environment were not in place. Um, and so they're basically beating up on solar ones. Um, our experience and data strongly suggests that these steps, that had these steps been in place, the attacker would have only had limited success in compromising valuable data, even after gaining to access to agency environments. Uh, so let's think about that for a second. In the incident response cycle for SolarWinds, um, <clears throat> we know that there was at least, you know, uh, a one or longer year dwell time, right, before anyone was aware. Could easily go back to 2017. People didn't know about it until the end of 2020. Uh, so that's at least three years dwell time. And what about zero trust would have helped uh, in any of the impacted companies? Let's just not talk about solar winds themselves, right? Um, but instead, someone running solar winds Orion. Uh, so zero trust could potentially have helped a lot of the 18,000 victims because of one of its principles of logging, right? And visibility. Uh, if people even had logs to look at and say, hey, you're right, we were compromised because these logs show it. Uh, but a lot of companies didn't have logs. And so, yes, it is true. Zero Trust could have helped with a lot of these agencies. But would they have not been breached? Um, no, they would have been breached. But at least you'd have evidence of it. Uh, so that's helpful for Zero Trust. But it still doesn't keep the cow from leaving the barn, as they say. One of the other principles, though, um, is that... Uh, the idea of always verifying authentication you know, at the time and having multi-factor auth, for example, um, that could have been helpful. Um, some of the systems that were compromised after the, uh, after, the, um, after the SolarWinds attack, let's say that you are the Department of Energy or Department of Commerce and you were running SolarWinds, you got compromised and you didn't know it. How could Zero Trust have helped? Um, so I think they're talking about some of that here in these diagrams, um, but there are some truths. There's some truth to the uh, to the assertion that some of the companies would have been in a better position to at least know that they had been breached because right now a lot of them don't even know it or can't prove it or disprove it. Uh, so now both the NSA and Microsoft are recommending this model for critical networks, Department of Defense, of course, as well as large enterprises and non-critical, uh, but you know highly prized targets. Uh, like uh, NVIDIA or who are some of the other companies that we know that were hit with um, SolarWinds. Uh, anyway, there's a good 100 to 300 of them uh, and a bunch more that'll be coming in the news stories and cycles um, in the coming weeks and months, I'm sure. Anyway, so Zero Trust is a long-term project. It's not a tool, remember it's a philosophy. And the guiding principles are constant verification of user auth and authorization. Auth N, uh, this is authentication and Auth Z, authorization and least privileged access, segmented network. Um, so a lot of people won't be able to do this tomorrow, right? Um, segmenting your network requires time and effort and potential downtime and maintenance, and, you know, designs and architecture and planning. Uh, you have identities and devices, what's happening here? Security policy enforcement in the middle, threat intelligence is feeding into it. Organizational policy defines what kind of policy you're gonna write on your tools. Microsoft is looking, I guess, to sell things, of course, uh, and their Azure infrastructure and tell people to start using the cloud because they can do zero trust faster and better than you can do it yourself, which is probably true, actually. 
Um, but it's also, of course, a benefit to them to get more people. So what do we have? Identity providers, multi-factor auth, you know, user session risk is all in this bucket over here. Then you have device and compliance risk, you know, iPads and laptops and computers. And then over here, data, because that's what the bad guys are trying to get. Um, and apps, uh, SaaS apps, on-prem apps. Uh, you have adaptive access. Adaptive access, we talked about that before, right? The maturity model uh, where there's all sorts of other factors that go into whether an authentication event is met with a successful auth um, response. And just because you have the right username and password doesn't mean you should be let in. And that is definitely a tenant of zero trust. And that is definitely an improvement in the world of security. Um, the bad guys got access to um, the uh, infrastructure and because of persistent you know, uh, remote access, uh, because of unchanging passwords, they were able to bypass MFA in many cases, for example. There's a really good talk uh, from RSA uh, Conference 2019 that talks about how MFA can be bypassed and how it was done in the SolarWinds examples um, more recently so that they were able to use you know, user accounts that hadn't been turned off and didn't uh, bypassing MFA. MFA doesn't mean it can't be broken because it can. And there's good ways you know, to illustrate how to do that. But MFA is way, way, way better than single factor, right? Um, but that doesn't mean it's bulletproof or that it's perfect. <clears throat> so you still need these other aspects of zero trust uh, in order to be successful in the preparation phase of incident response, which is to have logs enabled uh, and have the ability to investigate an incident and to architect things to minimize the possibility of an incident occurring. Uh, let's see, the above diagram shows how zero trust security with security policy enforcement engine can assess in real time. So this policy engine, I guess they're talking about here in the middle, this to me feels like adaptive auth, right? It could be ADFS, it could be secure auth, it could be ping federate, it could be Okta, it could be duo. All sorts of these tools can sit in the middle here and look at all of this information and decide, hey, hey you know, this looks too risky. I'm not going to auth, uh, successfully auth this event, even though they came up with the right username and password. Uh, that would be uh, an improvement in everyone's uh, security posture. Uh, let's see, understanding controlling how users access and devices engage in the data is fundamental purpose of zero trust, NSA explains. I wonder why that's a hyperlink. Um, looks like maybe that's one of their articles on supporting this. Embracing the zero trust security model, National Security Agency. Um, oh, this will be fun. Um, let's download this NSA document. Let's put it on my desktop for a second and cut over to, and let's do um, exif tool a uh, CSI. So what kind of information pops out of this NSA document? Nothing, right? They've mm, <laughs> redacted all of the interesting stuff that might be inside of there, the metadata of a PDF published by them. And the document name looks the same. Creation dates are all clear. Um, MDLS is another tool built in actually to the OSX that does this. Uh, for X, EXIF tool, you have to actually download it um, and uh, add it through brew or something. Um, but MDLS tells you a little bit more about the file. So this is the command that I ran, MDLS and then the NSA PDF. So typically under here, if information is going to be disclosed about who the author of the document was, this is where it's going to show up. Uh, but they've stripped that out, so that's good uh, to know that the NSA knows how to create PDFs that don't have, um, uh, you know, extractable metadata in it that says, oh, it was created by you know, John you know, Winklesworth or something, right? Uh, but anyway, so that's clear um, that that's uh, a clean PDF. And the exec sum here, zero trust assumes that a breach is inevitable, blah, 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 falling behind increasingly sophisticated threats, what is zero trust? And so I think they're just, uh, you know, interesting that they're in the model now of uh, publishing stuff that Microsoft and, you know, Palo Alto and others are, are selling solutions for. Um, it's in their interest, in their mission, I guess, to help make industry better and stronger, right? Uh, let's see, so access method, attempts to access network, uh, visibility and analytics, obviously these things should be logged and detected and reported on. Zero trust would help with that. Uh, let's see, malicious actor compromises a user device credentials, they access the device, the device heads in here, they're allowed, um, user enrolled device are authorized to access specific data on policy and context, 
other information um, blocked, right? Lateral movement is prevented by segmentation on the network and default deny policy. And let's see, blocked user role is not authorized access. So these are just three options for trying to visualize uh, what zero trust means if implemented in an architecture uh, and design. Compromised supply chain, I don't think that they have good writing on that, you know, in terms of how this would stop a supply chain attack. Because basically the SolarWinds um, backdoor, you know, um, software, right, that had been compromised um, with a supply chain attack and had a backdoor in it, it was trusted code, right, from a trusted vendor. It was code signed and it had all the right signatures and certificates involved in it. So there's a lot of stuff that wouldn't look bad and wouldn't have triggered uh, for uh, a, you know, a zero trust design in the SolarWinds example. But that doesn't mean there are plenty of other situations where it would have triggered. Uh, so obviously we can't say zero trust sucks because it couldn't have stopped you know, APT29 from attacking supply chain and, and, and infiltrating the build server you know, for the SolarWinds Orion product. Um, and then, of course, I guess you know, four or five levels of maturity uh, with and without uh, zero trust. How prepared are you? What's your maturity model? Are you in advanced position, intermediate? So I suppose this could go into you know, categorizing risk and doing good incident response um, in the practice of this article. Uh, let's see. I think we want to jump out of this one. Oh, there's the same uh, diagram that I found. Um, zero trust network benefits, same diagram that I found. Um, third example, where the actor adds malicious code to a popular enterprise network device or app. Under a zero trust architecture, the compromised device or app would not be able to communicate with the threat actor because it would not be trusted by default. Um, I suppose there's some truth there. I mean, the command and control server <clears throat> um, was certainly trusted by the malware that was trying to talk to it because the malware knew exactly where to go and said, I'm going to go look for this DNS entry and I'm going to get back a response and that's going to be my command and control server I'm going to go to. Um, what they're saying here under a zero trust architecture is that the compromised Orion server, right, that you're running that has been backdoored um, ought to have been distrusting that command and control server um, in its general channel of communication. Uh, but of course, the actual line of communication produced by the malware was authored by the bad guys. So they're not going to say, oh, you know, I don't trust you, command and control server. You know, please prove you know, to me that you are my command and control server. Um, so I don't think that sentence is terribly true. Um, I think what they're talking about is that um, it could have been blocked, right? Egress traffic to an untrusted endpoint by the Orion host. So let's say you had not the Orion host itself that it was untrusting of, of remote endpoints, but the firewall, the egress you know, um, firewall that was tracking outbound requests saying, hey, I have no idea why you want to talk to this random server. I'm going to block it because uh, I know the servers you're supposed to talk to and you're supposed to talk to other solar wind servers uh, for quality reasons or for build and deployment. And so I suppose that aspect of it uh, is relevant. It wouldn't have been trusted by the process because the bad guys wrote the process, but the network infrastructure around uh, the Orion host should have stopped it from being able to be accessed. That much is true. But if you don't implement, <coughs> like I said, outbound firewall rules that say who can talk to what on the outbound, you just say most companies, you know, a lot of companies say uh, any, any is fine. Because uh, they just don't want to have to be keep writing rules that say, oh, this piece of software needs to talk to this server. We just updated this uh, server and it checks to make sure it has the latest version from this server. Right? You can get lots of false positives or true positives that would get blocked. And then you have to write rules for them. Those rules become burdensome because they break you know, the business flow and they change a lot right um let's say that you know you're running windows update on your server and microsoft has you know thousands of machines that may be communicated with um for windows updates and you want your server to just simply go out and instead of going to a windows update service internally and get the packages there let's say you have all of your servers just go straight out to Win microsoft and pull down the updates and um, apply them I can imagine a scenario where the same supply chain attack would happen and, and they would have infected some of those Windows Update servers on the Microsoft network. 
So even in that case, you would need another level of mitigation in order to stop uh, the SolarWinds hack from you know, reaching you know, a command and control server because they could potentially drop a command and control server into some of those trusted networks. That's when you need stateful inspection of traffic, not just what's connecting to what, which is like sort of high level, right? Port 443 between this host and that host, because the bad guys are all using you know, certificates and they're all using strong encryption for their communication channels. Uh, so it's not the nature of you being able to really look inside of that traffic. So you'll actually have to implement an outbound SSL proxy in order to do what the NSA is recommending here. Uh, and you'll have to decrypt all of that outbound traffic, analyze it statefully in real time, deep, deep packet inspection of SSL, which means you need to have the ability to issue you know, man in the middle certificates uh, and have it be trusted by your outbound SSL proxy, like a blue coat uh, proxy, for example. And make sure, I'm just, again, trying to break down what they're talking about here. Uh, in real world, you know, um, been there, done that uh, language. Uh, there's a lot of work involved in putting it in a, in a blue coat and in allowing your services to continue to work. Not to say that we shouldn't do it, um, but I'm just saying it's going to take a lot of companies uh, several years, you know, to get to a segmented network with logging enabled and egress traffic, you know, being blocked by default. Uh, so maybe that's enough for this story. Let's find another one. Um, let me close that and go back to our friend here and say Google shares POC exploit for critical Windows 10 graphics remote code, <coughs> remote code execution bug. Uh, this will turn into an incident for people. Um, Project Zero, Google's zero day bug hunting team, shared details uh, and proof of concept exploit code for a remote code execution RCE bug affecting a Windows graphics component. So this is CVE 2021. 24093 in a high quality text rendering Windows API named Microsoft Direct Write. Uh, they reported a bug in the Security Response Center in November. The company released security updates uh, on all vulnerable systems on February 9th during this month's Patch Tuesday uh, for Microsoft. Uh, impacts Windows 10. All right, so let's say you're working somewhere right now and you're reading this article. And you're like, oh crap. We didn't apply patch Tuesday updates yet. And this is a remote code execution vulnerability in something on our Windows 10 machines. Let's quickly go and read about it. Let's see, the CVSS is uh, 8.7, um, which is pretty high. Uh, so I would patch for this um, in an out of band patch and um, make sure this one gets rolled out um, pretty quickly. Remote code execution, these are all the different versions. These are the security updates that are available for it. Where's your typical Windows 10? Um, 64 bit x64. This would probably be the one that most people would need. Uh, this is the knowledge base article about it. Windows 10 version 1903 reached end of servicing on December 8th, 2020. That doesn't mean a lot of people aren't running it. Um, to continue receiving updates, we recommend you update to the latest version of Windows 10. Uh, improvements and fixes um, uh, addresses the net log on elevation of privileges. Uh, that's a different bone actually than the one we were looking at. Um, I wonder why this one doesn't mention the CVE that we were just talking about. Um, anyway, let's not puzzle over that too long and um, got some more stories to look at. Uh, let's see, alert Microsoft's ALEXA skills can easily bypass the vetting process. Um, okay, this could be considered a supply chain attack, right? Because you're seeing skills show up in the uh, AWS uh, ecosystem for these smart speakers. And uh, they can easily get malicious code into that ecosystem. Uh, so I suppose uh, a minute on this is uh, relevant. Uh, Feb 26 story, researchers have uncovered gaps in their vetting process for skills. The findings were presented on Wednesday at the Network and Distributed <coughs> System Security Symposium, a group of academics from Arur University, Bochum, and the North Carolina State University, <coughs> who analyzed 90,000 skills available in seven countries, including the U.S. Oops. Um, Australia, Canada, Japan, Germany, and France. 
uh, allows third-party developers to create additional functionality for devices such as Echo smart speakers featuring configuring skills that run on top, um, making them easy to initiate a conversation with the skill and complete a specific task. Chief among the findings is the concern that a user can activate a wrong skill, which can have severe consequences. Oh, okay, so this is kind of like typo squatting, right? If you say something and the intent is to launch a well-known trusted skill, like playing Jeopardy or something, and someone makes something that's maybe a homonym of Jeopardy. And so sometimes it's getting executed instead of the game that you wanna play. Uh, so the pitfall stems from the fact that multiple skills can have the same invocation phrase. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Anyway, indeed the practice is so prevalent that the investigation spotted 9,948 skills that share the same name invocation with at least one other skill in the US store alone. Across all of the seven skill stores, only 35,000 skills had a unique invocation name. I wonder how many uh, skills there are in total. Uh, given the actual criteria Amazon uses uh, to enable, to auto enable specific skills among several skills with the same invocation names remains unknown. The researchers caution it's possible to activate the wrong skill and that an adversary can get away with publishing skills uh, using well-known company names. To me, that's very similar to what we saw with um, the, um, um, what is it, package, um, package uh, confusion, um, git repo, I think it was. Anyway, it was a security story that was in our feed that I think we looked at last week as well. Uh, which talked about public and private repos, right? Yeah, here we go, dependency confusion. Uh, same kind of thing, right? And so if you have something that's from a private repo and it has the same name and they put a higher version number in a public repo and its sources, because uh, scoping isn't been defined, um, then uh, yeah, dependency confusion or substitution attack is called. Uh, and there's different ways to deal with it. Um, let's see, what was one of them? Anyway, I think uh, Sonatype uh, uh, Nexus IQ had the same uh, response, which is that you can actually analyze your repo for these and uh, scope it more specifically so that you don't go and source a package just because someone invented a malware that has the same package name as you're using here. Um, let's say Express you know, version 4.3.0, <clears throat> if a bad guy publishes 4.3.1, uh, they would be potentially sourcing, you know, the malware um, instead of the actual code. All right, so that's the same kind of story as that. Um, incident response, let's look for some more incident response. Uh, online trackers and treat <coughs> increasingly switching to invasive CNAME cloaking technique. Mm, not necessarily incident response, but a good story to look at. Um, what else? Uh, why would you ever trust <coughs> ALEXA after this? Researchers examined uh, the realities of using Alexa's tens of thousands of so-called skills. Only a fraction even have a privacy policy. All uh, right, that's not really incident response. Um, what else? Uh, Port Swagger Research Top 10 Web Hacking Techniques of 2020. Certainly it's good to know, or Port Swigger, sorry. Um, what the bad guys are using uh, for your preparation work. Uh, but let's see if we can find something that's really in the heart of uh, incident response uh, this week. Uh, this week in ransomware, turn the light down a little bit. Uh, let's see, uh, blah, 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 back from the holiday. New Jersey launches child services portal, no. Uh, Far side cartoon, no. Twitter scammers earned over 145,000 this week in Bitcoin, promoting fake giveaways through hacked verified Twitter accounts. Uh, it's an incident for Twitter to deal with, I guess, um, as well as people that have accounts that have are hacked. Um, I guess this is a story that we can, <coughs> um, sorry, my throat <coughs> ran out of water. Um, Twitter scammers earned over 145,000 this week in Bitcoin, Ethereum and Doge. <laughs> Cryptocurrency scanners have made at least 145 promoting fake giveaways. Um, at the time, these scams pulled in a massive 580,000 in cryptocurrency over a one-week period. 
the attackers uh, target verified accounts with thousands, if not millions of followers. Uh, then they tweet fake giveaway scams uh, from well-known people or companies such as Elon Musk, Tesla, Gemini Exchange, most recently, Chamath, Pili, Pipata, and Social Capital. Uh, when tweeting the scams, it's common to see different Twitter sock puppets talking to each other as they promote each other's tweets as shown below. Elon together with Tesla organized a giveaway. Yeah, right. Sure they did. Um, great. I have something special too here. Elondonate.com is the blog. Hope that helps. So they're basically creating fake, you know, um, validation to show that people are engaging with the scam, right? Uh, embedded in the tweets are links that uh, to sites that redirect to sites pretending to be medium posts that promote the giveaway and include further links to the actual giveaway. People continue to fall for these scams. <coughs> so these are some of the Bitcoin wallets. Um, and you can find out how much is in the wallet and not know who owns it. Uh, and so that looks like what they're posting here. Uh, Malware Hunter team has been monitoring these scams, has told Bleeping Computers the scammers continue to hack verified Twitter accounts with no sign of letting up. And let's see, Ethereum finally dodged a coin, the newcomer in cryptocurrency giveaways generated 26,000. As many of the sites associated with these scams switched to different URLs and cryptocurrency addresses, the scammers likely made much more this week. Therefore, everyone needs to understand that the vast majority of cryptocurrency giveaways are scams. It's safer to treat any cryptocurrency giveaway as an online scam and understand that anything you send will not produce anything in return. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> what else? Um, Twitter accounts. No. Okay. So no real incident response nuggets in that story. Let's go back and look for another one. Um, Amazon dismisses claims that they can be bipedal. Of course, they're going to dismiss those claims, but we just saw that it's just clearly true that um, there's a lot of skills that could be homonyms uh, for other skills and invoking one uh, is just like typo squatting or like the other issue we saw. Uh, let's see, NSA releases guidance on zero trust. That's the same article we looked at. <clears throat> same topic, different article on dark reading. Um, let's see, what else? NYPD lacks serious engagement with surveillance tech disclosure law. Critics said the New York Police Department took a lazy copy and paste approach to a new law requiring it to disclose its surveillance technologies. Um, State Scoop is an interesting one to follow. Um, I uh, added it to our feed. I think a lot of the work that's being done at the state level is more interesting than work that's being done at the federal level. Um, let me take down the brightness here a little bit now that it's getting later in the day. NYPD lacks serious engagement. <clears throat> the first round of disclosures about the use of surveillance technology by the NYPD under a city law adopted last year left many private sea rights and civil liberties advocates who pushed for the law's passage unsatisfied. In a, letter, in a letter to New York Police Commissioner Dermot Shea this week, the New York Civil Liberties Union wrote that the disclosures the department filed last month included about 36 technologies, including gunshot detection platforms, body-worn cameras, closed circuit television, and facial recognition lacked serious consideration. Among other criticisms, the organization accused the NYPD of taking a lazy copy and paste approach that repeated language across the 36 draft policies that were released, sometimes without even bothering to describe the correct system. On the disclosure for its use of unmanned aerial vehicles, the NYPD didn't even replace language related to body-worn cameras. Uh -huh. So copy and paste of a policy includes the you know, completely wrong language and terms for the policy it's related to. Um, yeah, that's not good uh, preparation. Remember, documentation and policy and compliance is one of the bar big parts of incident response. Um, I suppose a bunch of the you know, potential cases involving violation of these policies could be thrown out, given the fact that the documentation and the policy is you know, open to you know, a uh, accuracy uh, charge and saying that um, this isn't a real policy because it doesn't even refer to the right topic, right? So how can you process 
a conviction or a prosecution against someone if it's talking about aerial cameras right um, and body worn cameras uh, and uses the exact same language for example uh, so no way of knowing let's see the disclosures were ordered under the public oversight of surveillance technology or post act which the new york city council approved Last summer, the law requires them to provide the public with a list of all equipment, software, and systems capable of, or used, or designed for collecting, retaining, processing, sharing, thermal, biometric, and similar information along the explanations of how long the tools have been used. Schwartz said the policy documents also are incomplete because they do not identify the exact vendors. He said he's particularly troubling with respect to facial recognition, the technology used there in its disclosure. NYPD stated that its facial recognition tools are closely monitored by human operators. Um, all right, so that's not really incident response, but certainly in the preparation phase for disclosure and technology um, uh, oversight, um, you can definitely agree that um, copy paste laziness in those policy documents is not helpful. All right, let's see, we got another 10 minutes, another couple stories, how to protect sensitive data for its entire life cycle in AWS. Many AWS customers workflows require ingesting sensitive and regulated data, such as PCI data, payment card industry data, personally identifiable information. What does it say? <clears throat> Many Amazon Web Services customers, blah, 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 same title. <coughs> I guess we can look at this as a diagram example, right? Amazon's publishing a diagram on how to protect sensitive data during the entire life cycle. That's helpful. So what does the diagram show? Uh, API payload with sensitive data in plain text. API data, API payload with sensitive data is ciphertext. So yeah, we have date of birth, phone number, email, social security number, file level encryption process. So <coughs> I'm discussing the best ways to do that. Um, let's see, figure two shows CloudFront invoking Lambda Edge while processing client request. CloudFront offers multiple integration points for invoking Lambda Edge functions since you're processing a client request and your encryption behavior is related to requests being forwarded to an origin server. You want your function to run upon the origin request. <coughs> the origin request event represents an internal state transition. Blah, blah, blah. You're, you can associate your Lambda with the described adding triggers. Okay. Um, the Lambda edge function acts as a programmable hook. You can use the function to replace the incoming request body with the request body with the sensitive data fields encrypted. <coughs> wow, why is that cough bothering me? Um. Anyway, so this is definitely useful, but if you're already taking an unencrypted request, you've already lost, right? Um, because if you own the client side of this client server request, um, you should be encrypting it already on the client side, right? Not after it reaches your server and then encrypt it on the back end to your data. Because um, if you do a threat modeling of this, right? You have your client, your CloudFront, your persistent storage are saying encrypt it after it hits your edge. But really it ought to be encrypted over here, right? Where the client side is occurring. And so this is strange that this is considered a secure reference architecture because um, I don't think this would be secure, right? This first point right here from the client in a threat modeling approach, this little upload here from the client to your cloud front end is the one that they're gonna tap and try to man in the middle and access. Ah, my wife heard me coughing and brought me some water, thank you. All right, let's put that over here. All right, now I feel better, hey, all right. Um, so anyway, so this is, yes, this is good for you controlling this part, but even setting up this cloud front front end ought not to be accepting PII in plain text. Um, you should never design something that looks like that. And so this is uh, people describing how to consume data on the inside in a secure way. 
and how to encrypt it if you got it in an unencrypted format. But how I don't think you should be getting data in plain text, you know, for an API payload like that, especially if you've written the API uh, or if you own the client that's talking to the API, like you wrote a mobile app that talks to an API, or if you wrote, um, you know, some type of fat, you know, native client binary that runs somewhere. You should definitely be doing key exchange and encryption on the mobile app and on your um, application on the client side. Uh, so let's drop this one for a minute and jump back into the list and find something else. Nerd humor. Uh, T-Mobile discloses data breach after SIM swapping attacks. Awesome. This one's perfect. This one is an incident, and the incident response process can be discussed in relation to this story. Uh, T-Mobile discloses data breach after SIM swapping attacks. All right. American telecommunications provider T-Mobile has disclosed the data breach after an unknown number of customers were apparently affected by swim swap, SIM swap attacks. Uh, SIM swap fraud or SIM hijacking allows scammers to control of targets phone numbers after porting them using social engineering. So they're calling up T-Mobile and saying, hey, I just changed my phone. Can you move it over to this new SIM card? Uh, or bribing mobile operators um, and fraudsters. So if you pay your engineers and your mobile operators enough, then their resistance to bribery will go down, right? Um, but anyway, subsequently, they receive the victim's messages and calls, which allows them to bypass SMS-based multi-factor auth, stealing credentials and taking over their online service accounts. Criminals then log into victims' bank accounts to steal real money, change passwords, and even lock in the kiss victims out of their own accounts. The FBI shared guidance on how to defend against SIM swapping following an increase in the number of SIM hijacking. So let's see what the FBI guidance on this is. Um, and maybe you need to implement some type of um, additional controls. Let's say you have a bunch of corporate owned mobile devices with um, SIM cards in them. You can potentially talk to your mobile provider and say, okay, we want to have like double verification on SIM, you know, uh, and number porting, or we only do number porting through your portal and we will never call in, right? That's one way to mitigate the social engineering aspect that's going on here, which would be to lock down all change control to API based only, because uh, then they have to hack your system in order to do the SIM swap hack. And if they've already hacked your system, they probably don't need to get into the SIM swap, right? Uh, I don't know what to do in this case for personal users and individuals, but for corporate accounts and um, managing your fleet of SIM cards and phone numbers uh, for your corporate account. It's the same kind of thing on DNS registries when you put a, a transfer lock on it, which means someone can't just come in and say, okay, I need you to you know, change the DNS entry for this company and point it to this new IP address. Um, that's the same kind of attack, right? Social engineering used to affect um, you know, a compromise. And in the SIM swap uh, case, you know, you can put, you know, a domain on transfer lock. You should be able to put SIM cards on the same. So let's see if the FBI warning uh, heads in the same direction. Uh, the San Francisco Division of FBI is warning potential SIM swap, you know, an increase in the use of criminals to steal digital currency. Uh, certainly uh, Bitcoin accounts are useful for this, right? Multi-factor auth for that. Um, includes personally identifiable information. FBI wants to help individuals make themselves harder targets. Um, generally, the attackers follow this pattern. Identify the victim, swap the SIM card, socially engineer a customer service rep from the mobile phone company in order to port the victim's phone number to a SIM card and phone in the control of the attackers. Password resets. Initiate password reset on the victim's email, access accounts, um, digital currency keys, wallets, um, defeat any SMS-based mobile auth, um, steal currency. FBI recommends public take these measures to prevent becoming a victim. Protect your personal information. Avoid posting personal data online. Well, all that stuff is available. Yes, we can not make it easy for them, but in general, this one's tough, right? Because personal information about you, whether you published it or not, is always going to be out there. From court records, from other people's you know, accounts, uh, protect your financial information, avoid posting information about your financial assets, including cryptocurrency. That's less common, right? I mean, I guess you could brag that you have millions of dollars in Bitcoin. Uh, that'll turn you into a target. Um, take precautions with your mobile service provider. Call your mobile service provider and place a PIN on your account. Only individuals with the PIN should be able to make any changes. 
In addition, place a note on the account that mandates that any change to the account must be done in person at a physical location. So that's the same kind of mitigation I was talking about, except I was defaulting for the lazy technology solution, which is I'm only going to send you, you know, change requests um, through an API. That's if you're doing bulk through a corporate. But if you're an individual, you may not be using an API to do number porting, um, for example. But anyway, same kind of mitigation, right, which is uh, designate, you know, put a note on your account that says, I will never ask you to do this over the phone. Uh, use unique passwords, yeah, of course, um, use two-factor apps uh, or physical security keys, active two-factor auth. Oh, okay, so this is good. This is smart. Um, SMS-based two-factor authentication, right, has actually been deprecated. Um, SMS 2FA deprecated. Has actually been deprecated by NIST um, back in 2017, actually, um, as a strong second factor. Uh, because of this exact attack. And so the idea is that if you use an app, right, an authenticator app, it's way more secure than just having an SMS code because someone can do a SIM swap or a SIM cloning attack, get access to your account and play man in the middle. Uh, so let's see, this was in the year 2017. So, well, October, so we'll say three years ago. Um, NIST proposed deprecating SMS 2FA last year because of the vulnerabilities in an out-of-band multi-factor environments term deprecation confused people. Um, it just means we shouldn't do it anymore, right? And we should do some calculator apps and authenticator apps. SMS exploits go mainstream, which is currently obviously what we're seeing. Um, let's see what else. Um, described in the Times article, SMS required by most financial firms for tying customer accounts to phone numbers. Uh, remains the elephant in the room. The system will allow someone with the right phone number to reset passwords, and even without knowing the original password, a hijacker merely hits forgot password, and an instant new code is sent to the phone that they've hijacked. Um, that's just bad banking, you know, multi-factor auth, because the recovery mechanism needs to be as strong as the original auth and identity assertion. Um, but it's true that forgot password workflows are usually a lot um, uh, a lot weaker, actually, than the original um, uh, authentication uh, workflow. Uh, all right, so I think that took us to six o'clock. I don't want to keep you longer than I have uh, sort of planned uh, for the course. So let me stop the share. And uh, thank you for joining and listening. And uh, sorry for the coughing, but I have water now, so that's good. So I will publish the lecture um, and stop recording. Thanks a lot uh, for joining uh, in the chat, um, Kevin, and uh, have a wonderful evening if you're in this time zone. And uh, if you're not, then you know have a wonderful morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And uh, we'll see you next week with week six. And like I said, I'll publish the link uh, to this uh, for everyone else to watch it later uh, uh, when they're not watching in real time. Uh, as well as do some grading. Uh, I think I'll do some assignment grading this uh, weekend and get caught up. So you should see some grade emails show up for some of your submissions. And uh, you know, use the chat in Slack if you have any questions um, about um, you know the the assignments or or want to discuss security in general. All right. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.